All right. We are back. Roll call, please. Vieira. Here. Woods. Here. Dingfelder. Here. Carlson. Citro. Yes. Miranda. Here. And Maniscalco. Here. All right. Next up is item number 12. Ryan Manassi, Development Coordination. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Did you want to swear in any witnesses? Oh, if you're going to speak on 12 to 21, which concludes the agenda, please raise your right hand and we'll swear you in and we'll get it out of the way now. Do you swear or affirm you'll tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. I do. All right. Item number 12. Ryan Manassi, Development Coordination. Item number 12 was file number REZ 20-63 for the property located at 501 North Howard Avenue, 2113 West Gray Street, and 2114 and 2118 West Carmen Street. Um, the request before you is going from PD and RS50 to PD for office, medical, and business professional uses. I'll defer to the Planning Commission for their report, and please return to me so I can finish mine. All right, go ahead. Good evening, council members. David Hay with your Planning Commission staff. I have been sworn. If we could share my screen, please. Yes, sir, we Hopefully can see. you're all seeing uh, my screen. Yes. Uh, this case is uh, REZ 20-63. We're located in the Central Tampa Planning District, uh, more specifically the West Tampa Urban Village and the North High Park uh, neighborhood. The subject site is located uh, within proximity to transit. The closest uh, transit stop is one block to the north of the site on North Howard Avenue. Uh, the closest public recreational facility is Vila Brothers Park, which is within one fourth of a mile to the northwest of the subject site. And the subject site is uh, located within a level C evacuation zone. Here we have the aerial. You can see the subject site. It actually contains three separate um, parcels. Um, this is West Gray Street on the south. We have North Howard Avenue uh, to the west. This is the Brian Glazer uh, Community Center, Jewish Community Center. Uh, Howard Avenue, uh, there's a mix of office uses and some residential uses scattered throughout. And then once you get off of North Howard, um, it's predominantly single family detached with some uh, duplexers or older um, multifamily. Here we have the future land use map. Um, the site actually has two uh, future land use designations. Um, the uh, west side in the red along North Howard Avenue is the community uh, mixed use 35. And then uh, the eastern portion, the majority of the site is within that residential 10, which is the tan color here. Uh, the Brian Glazer uh, Jewish Community Center and south of the subject site in this pink is the community mixed use 35 future land use category. That's also prevalent up on West Cass Street, one block to the north. And then uh, we have some residential 20 uh, within these browns uh, to the south of uh, the site. Uh, the proposed uh, commercial structure will be in a portion of the site, this is the red here, uh, designated that community commercial 35, and the parking uh, will be within the portions of the residential 10. Uh, so the parking area is larger than the structure. Um, given the commercial development pattern on this portion of North Howard Avenue, the Planning Commission staff has determined that the request would not be out of character with this surrounding area um, consisting of office uses and, and uh, other light commercial uses. Uh, the City of Tampa Comprehensive Plan recognizes North uh, Howard Avenue as both a transit emphasis and mixed use corridor. There's specific policy language within uh, the comp plan dealing with uh, both of those designations. Uh, the plan supports development along misuse quarters that promote uh, redevelopment patterns and streetscape improvements that transform the visual and physical character of these quarters. The proposed office is placed close to the public sidewalk up along um, North Howard Avenue and parking is in the rear of the building and the entrance to the building is oriented with North Howard Avenue, which is consistent with this policy direction regarding mixed use. 
supporters. The plan development is proposing a parking lot on the north side of the alley, that's here, just on the south side of Carmen, which separates parking uh, from, um, it's that alley which separates the parking area from the office. Per land use policy 15.3.5, the design of parking bays within parking lots should facilitate safe and convenient walking to building entrances um, since there are no crosswalks provided within the parking area and there is no connection uh, to the sidewalk on Carmen Street, it is unclear how the policy is met. To ensure consistency with land use policy 15.3.5, the Planning Commission staff would strongly encourage the applicant between first and second reading to provide better sidewalk integration uh, within the site. Uh, the Planning Commission staff presented these concerns to the applicant in the Development Review Committee report and those concerns were not addressed. Uh, in conclusion, the plan development overall is comparable and compatible with the commercial development pattern on this portion of North Howard Avenue. While the applicant attempts to address the mixed use corridor policies, the planning commission staff again um, would request that that sidewalk issue be dealt with between first and second reading. And based on those considerations, the planning commission staff does find proposed plan development consistent with the provisions of the imagined 2040 Tampa Comprehensive Plan. That concludes my presentation. Question. Thank you. Councilman Dingfellow. Uh, David, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks for your presentation, this Councilman Dingfelder. Um, so just to clarify, looking at the map that, that we're looking at, the, the orange, the orange color is residential 10? Correct. And, and I see a lot of um, uh, parcels there. I can't, I can't see the houses, obviously, but I see a lot of um, what, what looks to be perhaps 50 foot um, single family parcels, both on Gray and on Carmen, um, pretty close to this site or immediately adjacent to the park, to the proposed parking lots. Here. Right, and across the street on Carmen. Up. Oh. Yeah. Right. So is there, is there any commercial intrusion along Carmen Street <laughs> along, up there or along the rest of Gray? Uh, my under, there is vehicular access points on Gray. I do not believe there's any on Carmen. I don't have the site plan in front of me. I think uh, they're gaining access um, to well, that I'm, northern I'm not, portion. I'm not, talk, I'm not talking about access, David. I'm talking about structures or, or parking lots or any other types of commercial intrusion into that residential 10 area. Well, typically, uh, Councilman, we um, typically we don't consider if there's not a vehicular access point that it's a commercial intrusion. You, you see a lot of parking areas uh, as our quarters become more intensive, uh, they sometimes have to provide because um, we have required parking in the land development code um, that sometimes they have to look at the residential lots behind it. I believe some of these, especially the ones on gray are already utilized uh, for uh, parking. Um, <coughs> but we, since there's not an access point on Carmen, we do not because they could adequately screen that. So then uh, typically you wouldn't have any commercial traffic on Carmen or um, visual because of that uh, buffer. Okay. And then on uh, Gray Street on the south side, you've got community mixed use 35 that actually goes back to Westland Avenue. So what, I, what I'm referring to specifically is the orange colored area. Is there, to your knowledge, is there any structures or parking lots um, that are in that orange area? I yes. believe there's some parking and some structures. Okay. Currently. All right. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? All right. Thank you. Mr. Manassi. Thank you, Chair. Ryan Manassi, Development Coordination. Again, this is item number 12, um, file number REZ 20-63. Um, the applicant is proposing to rezone the property at 501 North, uh, North Howard Avenue, 2113 West Gray Street, and 2114 and 2118 West Carmen Street. 
from plan development, which is currently approved under PD file Z05-130, ordinance 2005-287, uh, medical office use, and residential single family uh, 50, RS50, to the plan development to allow for the development of an uh, expanded parking area to the north and the addition of business professional office use to the existing 7,069 square foot medical office use. The uh, property currently contains a medical office use and the existing signage and parking will remain. The 0.99 acre property is located on the northeast intersection of North Armenia Avenue and West Gray Street and the subject site is surrounded by residential and commercial uses to the north in the commercial intensive CI and uh, zoning district and residential single family 50 uh, zoning districts. Office and residential uses to the south in the plan development and residential multifamily 16 zoning district and residential uses to the east in the RS50 zoning district. Um, the JCC is to the west and that was for day, uh, approved as a PD through uh, for daycare, preschool, recreational um, facility, uh, commercial private, I'm sorry, private commercial recreational facility, place of religious assembly and public cultural facility. And that's again in that west area. Um, the PD setbacks per the site plan are uh, north zero feet, south 10 feet, west four feet and east 200 feet. The maximum building height of the existing building is 35 feet. And the required parking based on the most intensive use as medical office is 42 parking spaces and they're providing 81 spaces. Um, item no, or no, page number four in your staff reports goes into 27136 for the purpose and staff does outline some um, descriptions for those uh, items. And then obviously be wary of the section 27139 four for waivers and the criteria for consideration through the site plan control district. There is a historic landmark uh, structure within a thousand feet of the subject property. It's the Fort, Fort Homer Hesterly Armory at 522 North Howard Avenue under ordinance 2006-312, ordinance date 12-5-2006. There are um, site plan modifications that would be required between first and second reading um, of this petition. Um, overall, just to show you on the site plan and maybe um, I know David was alluding to some of it as well, there is no access to the north, north portion. The existing medical office is here. The existing parking lot being here what the applicant is proposing is this new lot to be combined all of these lots into one PD with that use of business professional office as well as medical office, but then have this expanded parking area up here. As far as the aerial, um, I was trying to uh, look for it, uh, Councilman Dingfelder, as you were uh, asking David to see if there were any other parking lots in the area. Um, but through this, uh, through this PD rezoning, uh, they, they can use this as a uh, consideration um, being compatible with this rezoning request. And let me show you some pictures. So this is the face I took of North Howard. This is the existing office structure. And there's the existing parking lot. This would be going to the east here. And again, the parking lot showing that buffer wall. That's between the existing parking lot and then the closest residential. You're off, to this. The, you're, you're off the screen. Oh, I'm sorry. I should be able to see that. It's right in front of me. <laughs> um, to the south here. So this is that structure that you see right here. It's a uh, single family residential and you can see there is a uh, solid concrete wall there. Um, to answer your question, to the south here, we'll have some pictures in a moment. I'll show you the multifamily that's there. This is, I'm sorry, I'm pulling off screen. This is the, the existing, it's an uh, alleyway and it might be better shown on this little vicinity here. As you can see, there is an alleyway right here and then it goes north. This is the one going east. This is the structure to the north. It's single family currently and it would be outlined here in red. This is where the expanded area is for that parking that the applicant is proposing. Um, and just to uh, bring up, since uh, the previous hearing, this was continued for the applicant to go back to historic preservation to get a determination on that property. Um, the 2118 West Carmen Street. Um, this is the memorandum from Historic Preservation. It's stating while um, Mr. Tokley is a very respected and living poet who is active in his field, the property does not satisfy the criteria as established for historic significance by the City of Tampa Code of Ordinances, Section 27257A1 to um, I through um, IV. Um, the motion was approved with a vote of 600. 
And I just wanted to put that on the record because there was a lot of discussion about this structure being demolished. Um, and again, this is where that expanded parking will be. Um, I tried to get a picture of the existing parking lot and then the single family here to the west. This is to the north, there are newly homes being built. And that would be north of Carmen Street. And this is to the south. You can see it's more of a multifamily. Again, the buddy neighbor single family. And then the JCC to the west. And this is the buddy neighbor to the east of, this would be on Carmen Street where the parking lot would be, um, the expanding parking area, single family home. And that's just that alleyway that's going north, as you can see here, through the property. With that being said, uh, the development review and compliance staff has reviewed the application and we do find the request consistent with the City of Tampa Land Development Code. Um, in the event the City Council does approve the request as well as the waivers, um, there are three being requested on page one of your staff report. Uh, the report outlines additional modification to be completed between first and second reading of the ordinances. Now I will say before I turn it over to the agent that the agent has requested some possible changes that he addressed with the neighborhood concern. I'll let him go into more detail with it. Um, staff did take a look at them though, however, so if it is something that the agent wants to go forward with, which would reduce some waivers, um, these would still be minor modifications between first and second reading that can be accomplished. And uh, staff is available for any questions you may have. Councilman Citro. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Manassi, for this square footage of this building, how many uh, parking spaces are required? That would be uh, 42 parking spaces and the proposal before you minus any uh, changes that the agent may request or show would be 81 spaces provided. How many square foot is the building, if you know offhand? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, 7,069 square feet. Thank you very much, Mr. Manassi. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Councilman Dinkfeld. Um, just a, a follow-up to Mr. Citra's question. So how many spaces are there currently in the existing lot, the southern, the southern lot? I would have to count them, sir, um, unless Jonathan Scott with transportation would know off the top of his head um, by looking at the application. But the existing lots are just as to show you on the site plan would be right here. Right. What I'm trying to figure out, and I think that's where Mr. Citro was headed before, yeah, was was to, does the existing lot satisfy the needs of the of the building? You want to answer in that? terms of in terms of the requirement, you know, the the requirement. I, I know it's, it's not an my existing turn, building but and it, an existing building and an existing lot. So, so that's what I'm a little confused about. Mr. Dingfelder, yeah. we have a presentation just to address that particular point. And in the meantime, sir, I can have Jonathan uh, take a look at the site plan to get that answer as well as staff side. So that way we can All right, come back to us <clears throat> afterwards. Thank yes, sir. All right. Anybody else? Yeah, go ahead, please. <coughs> Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, Council Members. This is David Mechanic, 305 South Boulevard, Tampa, Florida. I promise this is my last one this evening. You promise? <laughs> uh, uh, promise. Um, I, we have some documents to enter into the record and they'll be referred to during the presentation. I have with me virtually Randy Cohen, who will do a presentation both with respect to the parking demand as well as the question about compatibility of the um, the expansion of the parking lot for the eye clinic. Uh, just a few housekeeping items. We uh, we we do agree with the all the changes that uh, the staff have requested for the site plan. I'd like to clarify the only change we asked Ryan. Um, to make was we are eliminating waivers two and three. We, we initially asked for a waiver of the buffer uh, on the uh, east and west property lines from 15 feet to 10 feet. However, um, in response to some concerns with the uh, neighbors, we've eliminated the uh, waiver request 
and so that the buffers are at code at 15 feet on both uh, both property boundaries. Um, it it causes the uh, the requested parking area to be reduced by 19 percent, and Randy will give you the specific numbers on that. Also, waiver two then gets eliminated because with the increased buffer, we're able to plant replacement trees in that buffer area. We don't need to um, uh, pay, pay into the tree bank. Um, one other just item that, that Ryan did discuss, I'd like to go into it slightly more detail. Um, we went, we applied at the Historic Preservation Commission um, to determine whether or not the house at 2118 West Carmen was historic. Uh, we, we went to a, a noticed public hearing um, on December 1st, and that was, by the way, that's the same notice that the uh, neighbors get for uh, a rezoning. It's a 250-foot 200 foot radius um, surrounding the subject property. Um, as Ryan just mentioned, the Historic Preservation Commission determined that uh, the house did not meet the criteria for historic uh, status under the City of Tampa criteria. Um, I would also just note that no, no one from the public uh, attended that hearing. Um, at this point, I would like to introduce Randy. I hope he's here virtually somewhere. And he, I'd like him to speak to the parking demand and the compatibility issues. Good evening, Randy Cohen. Hope you can hear me. Yes, were you sworn in, sir? That's what I was going to say. My screen was not turned on by staff until after the swearing, so I need to be sworn in. I do. And if I would, I'd like to share my screen if that's possible. Okay. Thank you. Um, want to talk first about the site plan, just to describe what's going on. Uh, Wait, we don't, as we Mr. Don't Mechanic see it yet. indicated, we're increasing the buffer on the east side of the property by 50% and on the west side of the property by 50%. That results in our parking spaces being reduced by 19%. We don't see um, your screen yet, sir. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Did you share it? Oh, there's, oh, there's a, that's new to me. Okay, we have it here. I'll now we, hear, now we I'm see sorry. it. Okay. Um, this is a colorized version of the site plan. Um, the parking lot that seems to be the most in question is this one up here. The two waivers we're removing uh, would require that this buffer be increased by 50% all the way down the site, as well as this buffer over here to the west. Um, our setback from Carmen Street is the average of the setbacks of homes in this general area, so we're maintaining that frontage as well. These changes do reduce our parking, additional parking by 15%, by 19%, excuse me, from 82 spaces to 71 spaces. With this design, we're able to keep both of the grand trees that are currently on the property that form part of the front yard of the house that's been the subject of discussion. We do provide all of the screening and buffering in code. We are consistent with the overlay, the West Tampa overlay itself. Um, moving from this a little bit to answer Councilman Dingfelder's question, the original proposal was for 82 spaces. That's been reduced to 71 spaces. The total spaces existing on the site today are 35 spaces, and they expand and extend in this area back into the neighborhood. Um, moving on, we have done substantial work on parking to demonstrate the demand and need for this. We've looked at all of the records of January 2019 through February of 2020. But before I get into that, I'd like to show you a photograph. This was taken at 10 a.m. this morning. Um, this is the parking lot. Adjacent to the building, every parking stall is filled. The northern parking row adjacent to the alley, every parking space is full. This is the remaining two spaces of the existing parking lot. They look full. There's actually three spaces that are 
not occupied. The rest are full. Mm -hmm. Substantial parking along Gray Street. Uh, substantial parking right here on Gray as well. This is actually a patient, uh, an elderly gentleman. And I will tell you, being an eye clinic in this particular case, we have a number of elderly patients. We have a number of visually impaired patients. So having a situation where folks are parking on the right of way is just not an acceptable thing to do on a long-term basis. Um, moving back to this, I will talk about the fact that of the 261 work days in 2019, we were over capacity in our parking lot 135 of those days. That's just a little over 50%. I've broken this parking demand down into three categories, which is to explain why to some folks observing the parking lot, they would say, well, the parking lot isn't full and they're absolutely correct. 95 days, they are not full. That is because on all of these days, all of the staff for the eye clinic are not permitted to park in the parking lot. They are actually parking on Gray Street and Westland Street. Um, move just quickly, memo showing that that's where they're required to park for this operation. So moving to the first column, 95 of those 135 days, the parking lot would appear to be half to three quarters full anytime during the day. If staff parking were there, this parking lot would be totally full these 95 days. The next column, 27 days, staff is still parking on the streets. Um, parking lot is three quarters to all the way full every one of these days, 27 days, 10% of the year, which is actually 20% of the 135 days. There are 13 days during 2019 where the parking lot was overflowing. Patients were forced to park in the street as well as all of the staff. We have a very significant need for additional parking for this eye clinic. And it is not a situation that is acceptable. Uh, we've had complaints from some of the adjacent businesses about parking in the street, parking in their parking lots. Our applicant and owner is attempting to correct those situations, providing the additional parking that's needed. Um, from this, I just want to move on quickly to compatibility and I want to run through a number of the places in town where we have this similar to exact situation. This is Bayshore Social Club, the old Stovall house. Highlighted in yellow is the parking that's been expanded into a neighborhood. This is the Bellamy, which is a condo project on Bayshore with parking expanded into the neighborhood. It may look like it's a nice little pool area. That's actually the third floor. The first two floors of this particular area is a parking structure expanding into the neighborhood. This is Wrights Gourmet, again, with the parking lot expanding into the neighborhood. This is actually the Tampa Municipal Office Building, which is on Columbus Drive, generally at Hines. And their parking is actually all across the street expanded into the neighborhood. Next one, this is La Terracita, which has over the years, numerous times expanded their parking lot into the neighborhood. This is on Armenia Avenue, just south of Columbus Drive. This is St. Joseph Street, office building to the north, parking lot expanded into the neighborhood. Office building to the south, parking lot expanded into the neighborhood. This is on Cass at Gilcrest, parking lot expanded into the neighborhood. Moving on to Kennedy Boulevard, this is Miguel's parking lot expanded into the neighborhood. Moving over to here, this is the Solomon Law Offices, parking lot expanded into the neighborhood. Duckies, parking lot expanded into the neighborhood. All three of these expansions are parking lots across an alleyway for the, from the building. Moving on now, let's talk in particular about the neighborhood that we're in, Kennedy Boulevard, Howard Avenue, moving up to Gray Street. First block, Kennedy Boulevard, this is North A, commercial parking lot, the entire northern half of the block, currently under construction with a commercial building and substantial parking in the area. This is the Hardeman Landscape offices, parking expanded into the neighborhood. This is the Williams Funeral Home, parking lot expanded into the neighborhood, also to the north, parking lot expanded into the neighborhood. 
This is the office building directly south of the subject property, parking lot expanded into the neighborhood. Then we have our site with parking lot expanded into the neighborhood. Important issue. We have no additional traffic. It's simply a matter of where people are parking. We have no access from the parking lot to Carmen Street. We are consistent with the West, Shore, the West Tampa overlay as well as all code requirements. The parking lot expansion requires no waivers whatsoever. Our only waiver is for the existing driveway that's on Gray Street that would remain on Gray Street because there's no physical access available to Howard Avenue itself. And with that, I'm very happy to answer any questions you have, especially as they may relate to the parking demand. Thank you. Any questions at this time? Councilman Seach. Thank you very much, Mr. Cohen. Thank you very much for explaining the necessities for uh, the additional parking space. And I do enjoy that you had given us examples around the uh, city. I personally would have omitted the Stovall House, but I digress. Uh, my concern with these types of parking going into uh, the neighborhoods, encroaching into the neighborhoods, are the hours of operations. What are the hours of operations of this business or any business that may come after it as far as medical goes? Typical medical office building, 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. So I, I, I take it that your concern to the neighborhood is not the, uh, the light headlights from all the cars parking, not the noise, not the... Uh, the uh, 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 people being there after, say, 6 to uh, to 7 o'clock at night? Correct. I do not believe so. All right. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Mr. Chair? Chair. Yes. If I'm, yes. I'm sorry. Ryan Manassi, Development Coordination. I wanted to answer Councilman Dean Felter's uh, question just on staff side of point of view. Um, just to remind you again, this is a, an, an approved PD, so it's uh, the file is EO5130 may have been for that 39 spaces through that previous approval in 2005. But to answer your question, as it's currently laid out in the proposed site plan to you, that existing area is actually 49 spaces right now. So they may have restriped it for this design that they're presenting tonight. Um, the medical office for itself requires 42 parking spaces per the site plan as well, if that answers your question. And then just one more thing I wanted to add, because the hours were just brought up, is that the PD currently does not have any restrictions on the hours. Um, but you, if you wanted to place that condition, that'd be something that we'd have to add to the site plan. Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to be enforced. Councilman Goods. Is the uh, lot currently that's there now, is it gated or uh, at a certain time, or is there just an, an open parking area? You just go and just park? If, if I may answer, uh, it is not gated. As a matter of fact, with the previous PD, gating was prohibited on this particular property as a result of solid waste operations and them wanting freedom as to when they would collect solid waste. And there is a public alleyway that would separate these two parking lots that cannot be closed, cannot be gated by a private entity. Thank you. Well, and to, to anticipate the, another question, um, we, uh, Dr. Weinstock has no intention of leasing the parking lot after hours to any other users whatsoever. Um, that's not his intent, and we would agree to a condition that would stipulate to that. So we have no interest in. He's not trying to, you know, benefit financially from this expansion. He's just trying to serve the needs of the eye clinic. Thanks. You read my mind, Mr. Mechanic, tonight. I'm sorry. Read my mind tonight, Mr. Mechanic. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mechanic. Mr. Chair, if I may, thank you, Mr. Mechanic. Uh, my concern was maybe that that would be leased out in the evening time for surrounding businesses to park their customers there. Thank you, Mr. Mechanic. Yes, I, I actually drafted a condition that I could read into the record if, uh, and that I could hand it to you, Ryan, if, if this was acceptable. Uh, applicant shall not lease any parking spaces to persons or companies who are not employees or patients of applicant's office. Uh, Councilman Miranda. Uh, Dave, uh, Mr. Mechanic, I'm not an attorney. I don't possess to be one. However, it doesn't say you can't park there. It says that, you know, you can't. He's not going to lease it. How is well, he going to prevent someone else from using it? I, I, we could add language to say shall not uh, lease or permit parking 
to anyone who is not a, uh, an employee or patient of the office. I can certainly add that language. Yeah, but the, the problem is, I, I, don't, I understand the, 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 the feeling that he has, he doesn't want to do it, but how is he going to prevent anybody else from using it because he's not going to have anything to close the gate? He doesn't have a gate, he doesn't have anything like that. I, I don't. So uh, Randy Cohen, if, if I may, one easy way to deal with that is to have the property signed for tow, which means that anyone that parks there without permission can be towed, and a towing company is unfortunately <laughs> very active in towing vehicles when it's in a posted lot and they have the permission of the owner to tow. Councilman Dingfelder. A couple of questions. Uh, Mr. Cohen, um, the page you had up, and maybe you want to put it up again, the, uh, the talked about a full year's worth of demand. Yes, sir. Can you put that up? Get to it right here. Okay. Uh, I've, I've oh, that, one. Okay. There it is. Uh, uh, and I know but, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Vieira would... Uh, tell me uh, not to ask a question that I don't know the answer to, but I don't know the answer to this, but how do you, uh, how, how did you come up with the, with this data? Did you have somebody out there counting cars? No, sir. Unfortunately, we could not, not do that because of COVID. Um, we actually started this process in February of 2020. Um, COVID was upon us there was not a reasonable way of dealing with parking. So what I did do was starting January 1st of 2019 for that entire calendar year, plus January and February of 2020, we reviewed patient appointment records and staffing for each working day of the year. From that, we were able to determine what the parking load was for the parking lot on any given day and when we would have our peaks and generally what those percentages would be. Now, are they 100% accurate? Of course not, but they are reasonably close and reasonably appropriate. And one of the reasons I was very interested in this is I had heard some, some things about the parking lot seemingly not to be full very often at all. Uh, that caused me pause until I found the directives that in fact, in talking with staff, that they were being required to park off property for literally almost three days a week, every week of the year. Then it became clear what was going on, that they were exceeding parking, even though in that first column of 95 days, the parking lot may not appear to be fully occupied it was occupied to an extent that had staff parked there, it would be overflowing. Second column, the parking lot was virtually full. And this is not for a full day. This is for the peak parking demand times of the property, which generally are mid to late morning and early afternoon. So this is not something that's a all day long affair like it would be with an office building. As a medical building, parking fluctuates during the day. Uh, but we went through every appointment and tallied them all up and worked with that data and then the staffing that was required to be there for those particular days based upon the number of doctors there and the number of staff there necessary to handle that client that particular patient load on that day so looking at your data in in january of 2019 Yes. You had five days of greater than 200%. Yep. We so had what is, how does, so what is, how does that leave the other 15 work days of the, of the month? That's correct. So, so the other 15 work days of the month were at what percent? Typically, they were less than this. Staff was able to many times park in the parking lot, and the parking lot was not full. I mean, I mean, did do you have columns for that? Do you have data sheets for that, or, or? I, I, I summarized these all here. I have handwritten. Sheets. I mean, I mean, what it, it appears to me, Ms. Cohn, what you've shown us in these three columns are the are the worst case scenario days, but you didn't show That's us right. the other days. And number one, and number two is. 
maybe this just isn't the right location for such a busy doctor. I can't hear you. I don't know. I, I have no response to that, sir. They own the building. The city of Tampa approved the building. It's an eye clinic. It's been an eye clinic for a number of years. They simply are a very successful eye clinic, and they're trying to, through this rezoning, resolve a parking issue that they have. Okay, but in regard to the other columns, you, you don't have that available for us? No, sir. I, I will will directly admit and specify that 135 days out of the 261 work days in 2019, they were over parked. The remainder of the days, approximately 130 or 32 days, they did not have uh, a demand for their entire parking lot as it exists today. Okay. And my last question, uh, Randy, is, is there's, there's uh, situations where we have tried to shunt the traffic uh, away from the neighborhood. Um, I'm thinking about um, coming out of the Home Depot on, on, on the side street there. What is that? Spruce? Spruce? Mm -hmm. Right. Where you can only go, you can only go right out toward Del Mabry. Um, is that something that, that you've looked at, talked to Jonathan about? Um, any possibility there? Because obviously what the neighborhood is mainly concerned about is you're doubling the parking, you're doubling the parking lot, okay? You, you say it has no impact, but you're doubling the parking lot, and, uh, and therefore they're very concerned about the traffic going through, through the neighborhood. Um, and there's probably people online that are waiting to talk to us, and I apologize to them. But I've read, well, I, I've read, I've read the correspondence that's in the file. So, and I would, I would love to address that particular point. Well, it, my question specifically is, can you the shut traffic, the traffic away from the neighborhood? The, do they have me on? Yes, I'm on. Um, does not increase traffic, nor does it change no, the distance. Randy, my question is, can you shunt the traffic away from the neighborhood? Um, if we're talking about Carmen, we have no traffic on Carmen because we have no access to Carmen. If you're talking about gray, yes, we have a driveway as close as we can physically have it located to Howard Avenue. In the previous zoning, solid waste did not want the driveways gated, would not allow the alleyway to be gated, and wanted free movement as to turning right or left from the driveway onto Gray Street to service other customers in the area. So we can certainly talk to Jonathan about it. We can certainly talk to solid waste, but I'm just providing you with the information that I have at hand. You know, I, I would also point out that of all the comments that we have received, not one person was um, a, 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 a resident or a property owner on Gray Street. We, I specifically looked at that, and we did not hear any objections from people on that particular block of Gray Street. And I would, well, I would I'm looking at Monica, Monica sent us an email, and she said she lives at 3401 West Gray Street. Yeah, I think that's a mile away or so from the property. The, this, this address is 2100 okay. block. All right. Well, I thought you said nobody lived on Gray Street. No, I said that, that block of Gray Street. <laughs> All right. Anything else? <coughs> Mr. Manassi, anything? Chair, if I may, uh, Ryan Manassi, Development Coordination. I just want to clarify, just so I'm correct on my side, um, are, is the agent then okay with adding that note? And is that something that we're going to expect between first and second reading? Should this be adopted? I just want to make sure the language is correct and we're in agreement so it's on the record and it's clear and concise. We are more than willing to add that restriction. Then I, I would want, uh, just request, I just kind of wrote it down and just went over it with a legal parking lot will, be leased, uh, will not be leased or permit parking other than employees and patients, and then I put slash customers just because you have that business office, office professional use. Uh -huh. So I just figured it'd be good to yes. have that in there. Yeah, that, that, that okay? sounds fine. Okay. Thank All you. Right. All right. Thank you very much. If there's nothing else, we'll go to public comment. Do we have anybody here in the public that is uh, uh, wishing to speak on item number 12? I see none. We have registered speakers online. 
Uh, I see two of them, uh, Mr. Ramirez, and then we have a Sarah Garcia. <coughs> All right, if you would raise your right hand, Sarah and Carlos, to be sworn in. You swear our friend will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. All right, Mr. Ramirez, go ahead. You have three minutes. Thank you, uh, sir. Can I share my screen? Can you guys hear me? We we hear you, but nothing's come up come up yet. All right, one second. Yes, now we can see you. Great. <clears throat> uh, Carlos Ramirez, 2103 West Carmen Street. Uh, today I'm representing the North High Park Civic Association. Uh, the proposed rezoning will tear down two existing houses, one of them being the former home of Tampa Hillsborough County Court Laureate James T. Tokley, as we have mentioned, who also sent a letter in opposition. In their place, they're going to um, build a parking lot. Uh, we walk past this lot every day. I live on the 2100 block of Carmen Street, so I'm always walking my dog through here. My kids are always playing around, and this lot is never full. Now, this picture that you see here, there's cars parked on the right of way. Uh, the cars on the left belong to that building on the left, and the cars parking on the right in this particular situation, there was some uh, road work going on. But usually when you see cars like this, they are, there's usually a big event at the JCC, and all the cars from that event usually uh, bleed into our neighborhood and also Armory Gardens. As you can see, there's uh, always plenty of spaces available. Every time we walk through here, uh, there's always plenty of spaces. Now that the, um, the, the spreadsheet that, that the applicant has provided, um, they said that this was for the early morning peak and also for the early afternoon peak. So that would be a maximum of four hours, probably two to three hours of the time. So half of the time for two and a half uh, hours, this empty lot is, or this lot they say is full. The rest of the time, it's not. Uh, this is um, the zoning map for the area. This area historically has been residential. Uh, this was established by, um, this was part of the Benjamin lot additions that they have here. And as you can see, um, there are a lot of PDs that have come through. Uh, and they're just eating away chunks of our neighborhood. Uh, Mr. Cohen was very good to show that throughout the city, parking lots are taking over our neighborhoods. Um, so that is well established that that is going on. Uh, this is the future land use. We saw this earlier. Just again, want to point out that the rezoning is residential lots. Even for the future use, they're meant to be residential lots, but they're changing them into a parking lot. Um, I had a bunch of slides for waivers, but they have gotten rid of uh, two of them, so I will concentrate on waiver one, which is to permit access to the local street. Um, you will hear the traffic problems that we have here. If you read through the correspondence, you, you know that there's a speeding problem through this neighborhood. And also in this neighbor, uh, this intersection right here, um, there's been 12 accidents in the past five years. So now we have a bigger parking lot with cars coming out. Their choice are either to go into this intersection, which is very dangerous, or filter through the neighborhoods, going north towards Cypress and south to Kennedy. Um, and because they are closing these houses down, uh, the situation that you're seeing on Gray Street where cars are parking on the street will not be possible on Carmen Street because those driveways and those homes will go away. <clears throat> so we feel that this goes against LU Policy 6.1.9 and Section 27.139.4 because the traffic will be directed into the, into the neighborhoods and that's going to substantially interfere with the rights of the property owners. Uh, I just want to say real quick, uh, we are against this but we are not against development. We have talked to many developers coming into the neighborhood to, um, with great coordination, and we've had some really positive things come of it. We have not been approached by the applicant. Um, the Civic Association has not, neither has the Northern Park Alliance, which is the business group. Thank you very so much. So with that, uh, we ask that you deny the Arizona request. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Sarah Hi. Garcia. Yep. Hi. My name is Sarah Garcia, 2101 West Carmen Street. I have my son yelling in the background. Um, I can't really follow up from Carlos because he said it all, but we're on a small street. We're on Carmen. There's lots of kids. There's really no need to have a parking lot. I understand where they're coming from, but if you park in the street, it's not bad. 
I, I work downtown and I pay for parking. So be grateful you have a spot <laughs> to park and there's nothing there. There's, it would be just, there's two houses that just got built across the street from Domain, beautiful houses adding to the neighborhood. It would be wonderful to have another house or two built on that property instead of a parking lot. That's it. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I believe we only had the two registered speakers. I already asked if anybody here was speaking on it. Is there any other questions, comments from council members before we get a motion to close? Or any, I'm sorry, rebuttal from the, uh, from the applicant? Uh, David Mechanic again for the record. I'll, I'll be brief. I don't know if Mr. Cohen wanted to respond, but uh, just to the, to the two comments, uh, the gentleman said that the parking lot was never full. Uh, what, what Randy's analysis shows is that the parking lot is over capacity by at least two times, uh, f about 50% of the working days of the year. So while you, you can sort of say, well, it's half empty or, or it's half full, but the, but the point is the overflow is a problem when you have elderly and uh, uh, patients that are, who are visually impaired. So it, it, it's not a good situation, and I think the doctor is trying to do the right thing to avoid or reduce impacts to the neighborhood. Um, also, there was a comment about waiver one. Uh, he was objecting to waiver one. This is an existing driveway that was approved as part of the original project and was built. There's no other means of access to this parking lot other than if you wanted to open it up to Carmen, but that wouldn't solve any problem at all. That would make it worse. So again, this waiver is just simply to preserve the existing driveway. Uh, Randy, do you have anything you want to add? The only thing I would, would add is that we have staff parking on Gray and on Westland um, <coughs> a substantial amount of the time. On an infrequent basis, we have patrons parking along Gray and along Westland. This parking lot expansion will actually reduce parking on Gray and on Westland, which are perhaps concerning to those folks in that area. We have not seen any parking on Carmen. We are doing absolutely nothing to encourage parking on Carmen. And as a result, I think we've adequately shown and demonstrated the demand for this additional parking and that there are safety issues regarding this parking because of what's currently going on with on-street parking. Thank you. Council Thank you. Thanks. That is question. all we have. Appreciate your consideration. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Um, Mr. Mechanic, um, I know Mr. Shelby doesn't like to hear me say this, but based upon all the evidence and we're about to close the hearing, I, I'm, I'm not supportive of the petition. Um, you're basically, you're doubling the potential impact on the existing driveway. Um, and, and that's, you know, so to, so to say, well, the, the waiver as it exists today is the same. I, don't, I think it's disingenuous because it's twice as many parking spaces using that. I, we realize you can't, you have to get out to the side street, but you're doubling the impact. But, but that's not my, my question. I just wanted to tell you why I can't support the petition. But my question is this, David, is uh, Mr. Mechanic, if council approves this, I'm not sure it's a good idea to include the, con the additional condition that you just proposed to staff and legal. And the only reason I say that is if there is additional parking there, this, na this neighborhood has felt the impacts of the JCC, that maybe that would be a good place for the overflow parking of the JCC. Now, I know I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth. but. I, you know, I just want council to think about that a little bit because we've all heard about complaints of the overflow parking from the JCC. So before we go through on that condition, and that condition is forever, 
um, I want everybody to think about that. But like I said before, I probably don't have any standing to even mention any of this because I'm not going to support the petition. So. Understood. I think we are willing to add the condition or not add the condition at the pleasure of council. Anybody else before we ask for a motion to close? Move close. Second. Motion close for Councilman Good. Second from Councilman Vieira. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Any opposed? Uh, Council Member Vieira, would you mind taking this item? I will, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I hereby move in a substantive ordinance being presented for first reading consideration, an ordinance rezoning property in the general vicinity of 501 North Howard Avenue, uh, 2113. West Gray Street and 2114 and 2118 West Carmen Street in the city of Tampa, Florida, and more particularly described in Section 1 from Zoning District Classification, PD Plan Development and RS 50 Residential Single Family to PD Plan Development Medical Office and Business Professional Office, providing an effective date. And we have a second? If we can, if we can Mr. Chairman, do you have the additional information that you might yes. want to add? Yes, sorry. To yep. And also, if you can, uh, Councilman Vieira, with regard to the revision sheet that was provided by staff. Uh, and also the um, uh, reference, please, the proposed changes by the petitioner between first and second reading. And if there are any additional conditions, particularly with regard to the parking conditions, mm -hmm. um, if you could reference those, if it's council's pleasure to do so. Yes, uh, and also the proposed development is shown in the site plan promotes or encourages development. There's appropriate location, character, and compatibility with the surrounding neighborhood. Proposed use promotes the efficient and sustainable use of land and infrastructure. All right, do we have a second? I'll second that with the uh, with adding of the condition, yes. Mm -hmm. which, condition, which condition is that specifically? Uh, that they will not be used uh, for any other time except for patients and or work staff. <coughs> All right, we have a motion from Councilman Vieira. I'm sorry? Question on the motion. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Vieira, I know. Chair. Um, yes, Mr. Manassi. I'm sorry, if um, yeah. we're talking over here, we may need the hours of operations then if we're going to be restricting the um, to be for employees or customers only of the business in the motion. I, I believe Mr. Mechanic had stated uh, five. seven o'clock was the latest. No. Monday through Sunday. Are are we are we going to get more evidence that if we need to reopen at to reopen? eight o'clock in the evening? I, I don't think that has any impact whatsoever. I, Wait, let's get a motion to reopen the hearing. So moved. Second, motion from Councilman Citros. Do we have a second? Second. Yeah. Second from Councilman Moran. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Mechanic. I'm sorry. We had to reopen uh, the I, hearing. I'm, I'm sorry, David Mechanic, for the record. Um, I mean, we, we had proposed a condition which said we wouldn't <coughs> lease or allow parking to anyone outside of employees or patients of the medical practice. But hours of operation, I'm not sure how that works if a doctor is working, you know, filling out records at 8 p.m. Is that, that would theoretically be a violation of that condition. but. I mean, the, the normal patient um, in and out of the office is 5 or 5.30, uh, something along those lines. But, but again, there could be stragglers that could be six, but we're not talking about any significant usage at that point. Ryan Manassi, Development Coordination, just to add on it, and we're not trying to be stubborn with it, but it, it comes to an enforcement issue. If we have to actually enforce this no parking requirement, how do we enforce that without having some type of hours of operation? That's a simple one. Oh. Uh, again, we, we have stated uh, he has stated that that the uh, parking would only be used for clients. Correct. And well, patients, staff, clients, and doctors. And so, if a doctor is there until eight o'clock, he is still permitted to park there. Just from our standpoint, we would not know if that's the doctor or not. So, there's no. You know what I mean? There's no way to know when that parking lot is actually not being utilized so by the. Uh, then, Mr. Chair, I will withdraw my motion on on the conditions. But I just foresee something happening. What has happened at Vila Brothers Park, with the past? Councilman Miranda. Uh, I'm not trying to get involved in how to identify a car, or, but that's very easy when you. You can park your, you have staff, you know how many staff you have, you mark them as staff, and you have a little placard on the car with a number, one, two, three, four, five, six. 
And, uh, you know, unless you have a breakdown or something, you're going to drive your car 99.9% .9 of the time. You're going to do that. I do that at my other job. I park in my spot, and that's it. And I got a little placard that they give me. Well, we would certainly be willing to post the property that no parking other than patients or employees of the, uh, the eye clinic. Yeah, with, and, I, and I believe what the, the traffic consultant said, you may also post, you have it towed. Yeah, I, I mean, we are trying to be as cooperative as we could be here. I, I apologize. I, 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 I And I understand. Councilman Dingfeld. So if, if Mr. Citro would, withdrew his second, I'll, I'll, I'll second the motion, Mr. Vieira's motion to, in regard to this petition, um, without, without any of these conditions that Mr. Mechanics is referring to, because again, Mr. Citro, that, that's exactly the point is the Via Brothers, the problem with the Via Brothers was that was public property. That was park, that was city park. And it was completely wrong of the JCC and the, and the city to allow that overflow parking to go there. But the reality is, is that facility, the armory is a big facility, uh, for whatever reason, that got approved without enough parking, so now there's overflow parking. So my point is, if this passes, it might not be a bad idea for the, that some of that JCC overflow parking to be able to go 80 or 90 spaces in the evening or on the weekends into there. So that's why I think a, a more, more pure approach, Mr. Vieira's motion, and I can't tell you, Mr. Vieira, how to make your motion, but I think a more pure approach is just to approve what they've, what they've asked for and, and, and leave it there because, like I say, that, that might be a good opportunity to help the neighborhood with some of that overflow parking from the JCC. One um, last statement, Mr. Chair, if I may, please. But yes, then you're, sir. then, uh, Councilman Dinkfeld, then you're putting uh, undue burden upon the neighbors that live next to these parking areas, yeah. in my opinion. With, with their consent, I, 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 I would say yes, it's great, but we don't have their consent right now. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Councilman Goods. You know, again, you go with a double edged sword, and at the end of the day, uh, both ends of the sword are sticking the community. Uh, that's the whole premise of this whole situation that I see. Uh, at this point, I don't think I'll be supporting this, uh, this item because I don't see a win uh, either way you look at it, to be honest, uh, and I, just the way I see it at this point. Okay. And Can I get it, a motion? I guess motion. Did we? Wait, yes. We close the, 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 the hearing there. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say let's reopen. I would suggest because we're we talking reopen. about changes to the motion, and I think we, it's good to. It is open. We did it is. We did I'm sorry. We opened and closed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We did re it's currently open, Mr. Chairman. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm past my open. bedtime. Okay. And then, and, then, and then if you wish to, if you're done with your discussion, then then would be appropriate, if you don't want to take any more testimony, it's appropriate to close the, the May hearing. I have a motion to close? It, close. And I was going to say, but before, since we had some discussion, I'd like to hear from the petitioner on some of the issues we discussed, if I may. That would be appropriate before you close the um, hearing. Thank you. Mr. Vieira, we are, uh, as I said, trying to be as cooperative as we can. I mean, we would agree to the condition, or if it's, pre if it's deemed preferable to not have the condition, we would be uh, okay with that too. Uh, if I'm feeling counsel out here, I think that without the conditions, it's going to be more favorable. If I'm that, that would be amenable to you, I would assume. Yes, I mean, I suppose. Yeah, I'm not sure, but yes, sir. Well, let's let's hear from council members. I mean, if I may, in terms of folks' thoughts on this. I mean, before we we close. I mean, because we're having a, a couple of um, options here, I guess, if you will. Well, I, I haven't, mean, I haven't said much. <laughs> you know, I hate to see the Tokley House demolished, but it went before a, another board, it went before another group of, of people, and they did not deem it historical. You know, what am I going to do at this point? He doesn't live in that house. It was previously sold. You know, it's, it's out of our hands. Again, I'm, you know, I hate to see buildings knocked down because that's all we've been doing for the last 50 years. Uh, however, uh, you know, looking at this regarding the parking and putting those uh, stipulations there of not parking after this or that, there was the issue with the JCC that was brought up and a lot of complaints from the neighborhood because of the overflow 
and uh, and whatnot and Vila Brothers Park and all these things because I had to help with that so I would I would suggest that you know those uh, stipulations not be put in the parking and just leave it as is as you originally proposed it to have that flexibility should the property owner wish to lease that uh, parking to the JCC for overflow they have that option not just no parking and that's it so thank you know. certainly that and not to muddy the waters headlights don't create much problem during the day they only create it at night I'm not going to put the burden on the petitioner to have to put a wall or whatever around the parking lot and that's what's happening yeah that's all thank you we thank have you. a wall on both the east and west boundary per the code um, okay. yeah I saw a masonry wall on the site plan there so yes sir anybody else mm -hmm. motion to close second or no, no, first no. I guess all right first. motion from Councilman Vieira do we have a second second from Councilman Citra all in favor aye, aye. aye. Councilman Vieira do you want to yes um I I'll remake my motion again and and uh, wait for a second all right, we have a motion from Council Member Vieira. Do we have the second? And I'll, I'll second it, and, uh, and I'll assume that the motion did not include the uh, based. Yes, the based condition. upon based upon the 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 uh, number one, the applicant. There appears to be no significant uh, policy-based preference. I'll certainly go for it. That's fine. And, and Mr. Vieira, if I can just ref um, state or if you could just state again, it includes the revision sheet plus the changes that were presented yes. by the petitioner between first and second. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, we have a motion from Councilman Vieira. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Councilmember Dingfelder. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. Nay. We have a nay from we Moran. Roll call, please. Roll call. Roll call. Roll call. Vieira? Yes. Goods? No. Dingfelder? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Carlson Citro? Yes. Miranda? No. The motion carried with Goods and Miranda voting no and Carlson being absent. Thank you very much. Uh, second reading and adoption will be on January 14th at 9.30 a.m. Thank you. Thank you. Item number 13. Ryan Manassi, Development Coordination. Item number 13 is file number REZ 20-21. It's for the property located at 6805 North Navin Avenue. Uh, the request before you is going from zoning SHRS to SHPD, that's Seminole Heights Plan Development, uh, for a single family residential semi-detached. I'll defer to the Planning Commission if you please return to me afterwards so I can complete my report. Mr. Hay, you're muted. Here we go. Good, after, uh, good evening, Council Members. David Hay, again, uh, with your uh, Planning Commission staff. I have been sworn. Uh, the next site is rezoning 20-21. Uh, it is located within the Central Tampa uh, Planning District and more specifically within the Seminola Heights Urban Village and the old Seminola Heights uh, neighborhood. Um, there is transit uh, within the area, Hart Route 1 and the Metro Rapid route serve the subject site and it's uh, the stop is located uh, approximately 320 feet to the west. Uh, the closest public recreation facility is American Legion Park and that's located 0.17 miles to the north of the subject site and the site is not located within an evacuation zone. Point of order Mr. Chair, um, <clears throat> I think we should make sure the petitioner is online and participating and before we waste time on it is the petitioner do we have a it's a lease Batsel? councilman their um, their agent is here oh okay oh, okay I, I i was looking for a lease and uh, you weren't her so okay thank you mr go ahead sorry about that all right uh next on to the aerial uh this is the subject site uh pocahontas east pocahontas avenue is to the uh, south You've got uh, North Central Avenue about a block to the east, and then um, Sly Avenue and the interchange with um, I-275 is located about two blocks uh, to the north. Uh, the surrounding area is primarily single family detached. There are commercial uses present um, to the north of the subject site at the intersection of Sly and Central. Here we have the adopted future land use map. 
you could see the subject site and the parcels to the uh, basically on four sides are uh, all residential 10 uh, to the uh, northeast of the subject site it goes up to residential 20 that's in the brown and then we get to the more intensive community mixed use 35 uh, represented by the pink um, located uh, to the northeast around uh, central and sly avenue um, intersection uh, the adopted future land use map again uh, is residential 10. it does allow for single family detached housing uh, it does allow limited townhomes and other neighborhood serving uses the development pattern transitions to that residential 20 uh, to the northeast which allows uh, consideration for higher density um, than the residential 10. Um, the site is located within the Seminole Heights uh, urban village which is one of the designated areas of the city which seeks to, to support a high quality development pattern. In order to achieve a higher density within desired areas of the Seminole Heights urban village, a node bonus is in place, which seeks to focus infill development towards specific nodes and corridors. Uh, neighborhood policy 3.2.1 allows a density or intensity bonus for projects located within identified nodes in Seminola Heights. The subject site is within 0.5 miles of an identified community node, and that's at North Nebraska Avenue and East Slide. While the maximum density allowed for the site per the R10 uh, flu category is three dwelling units, the applicant is requesting one additional uh, unit for a total of four, which is allowable under the density bonus mechanism. Providing a mix of residential choices while respecting the scale of the surrounding community is consistent with the policy direction regarding all urban villages. Further, the comprehensive plan seeks to provide for different intensities of single family areas to reflect differences in the existing and desired character of these areas. A review of the elevations submitted with the site plan illustrates that the proposed massing and scale of the development complements the existing neighborhood. Proposed PD also utilizes an alley for garage access for two of the units, furthering comprehensive plan policy direction, specifically land use policy 4.4.6. The comprehensive plan also encourages new housing on vacant or underutilized land, giving the development potential available to be utilized in this area of the city through the node bonus the subject site is considered by planning commission staff is underutilized under its current use overall the proposed rezoning further several comprehensive plan policies promoting residential infill in appropriate areas especially within areas in proximity to employment and transit options proposed rezoning balances the need to be sensitive to areas planned for single family detached while also recognizing the need for additional housing options within designated areas. So based on those considerations, the Planning Commission staff recommends to you this evening that the, that the proposed plan development be found consistent with the provisions of the Imagine 2040 Tamper Comprehensive Plan. Thank you, that concludes my presentation. Any questions? Mr. Manassi. Thank you, Chair. Ryan Manassi, Development Coordination. Again, item number 13 is REZ 20-21. I'd just like to point out for the record, starting out, that there is a revised revision sheet that I will be turning into Mr. Shelby as well as Mr. Uh, crew over there for the city clerk. Uh, the agent as well as planning staff do agree upon the changes. And I'll hit on a couple of these changes towards the end of my report to uh, go into detail about the bonus node that David Hay was referencing. So the site's on screen and the applicant again is proposing to rezone the property located at 6805 North Navin Avenue from residential single family SHRS to Seminole Heights Plan Development SHPD. And this is to allow for residential single family semi-detached units. The property is located at the east side of North Navin Avenue between East uh, Hiawatha Street and East Pocahontas Avenue. The lot contains 14,700 square feet or 0.34 acres. The setbacks for the north are 17 feet, and that's for the primary structure, five feet for the porch, 13 feet for the attached garage. Um, to the south, 17 feet for the primary structure, five feet for the porch, 13 feet for the attached garage, and the east is three feet for the primary structure, 15 feet for the detached garage, and west 20 feet for the primary structure, 
12 feet for the porch and 60 feet for the de uh, detached garage. The maximum building height is proposed at 35 feet um, for the primary structure and 22 feet 6 inches for the accessory structure. The applicant proposes front entry to all units on the West North Navin Avenue uh, with parking access on the North East Hiawatha Street and the South East Pocahontas Avenue. Um, all units are two stories in height with the North and South units containing attached two car, uh, two car enclosed garage parking and the two middle units containing one, one porta cache parking and one car detached garage parking. The total of two parking spaces are required for each dwelling unit and two parking spaces are being provided for each dwelling unit. The property is surrounded by residential single family in the SHRS zoning districts to the north, south, east, and west. And the site is located in the Seminole Heights district and compliance with that development, um, with that district development standards is required. There were no historic uh, landmark structures within a thousand feet of the subject site. And there are some minor site plan modifications as uh, the revised site plan, um, I'm sorry, the revised revision sheet that I'll turn in um, that the agent and planning staff has agreed to. Um, that was for development coordination, natural resources, stormwater, um, and as well as urban design for the Seminole Heights district. Um, to go into the location, and David Hay pretty much pointed out, um, well, I'll show you the site actually that's on screen first and explain that a little bit. So the porta cachets for the two interior units that are facing Navin, and then the, the rear garage, so that's meeting the parking requirement for the two internal units, and then the, these uh, detached garages for the north and the south units. Um, so you have four units, and as David um, stated, per the policy in the comp plan, <coughs> it does state that um, the bonus node can be activated, and that's how they're getting the four units. Um, the determination for those um, improvements was reviewed by planning staff and, and as well as the zoning administrator to um, for enhancements to the benefit of the public realm. And what I'll show you now is the revised revision sheet, and specifically this bullet point item, um, this is the revise, it's, it's a revision that the agent um, sent to staff so we can review it with the zoning administrator to determine whether or not um, the enhancements would meet the, the definition or the interpretation of that policy 3.2.1. Um, as you can see, they're going to be adding a south, uh, on the southwest corner, they're going to show a pad and a public bench on the, I'm sorry, the northwest corner and add a pad with a public sitting area as a pop-up li library. And I, what I did was I snipped the two um, visuals from the, the, the plan that we reviewed um, to show council tonight. The reason this plan is not what is not the plan that's before you is procedurally I can't take in a, a revised plan at this stage of a rezoning and this bo bonus node language and interpretation took a little bit more time. So that's where the request between first and second reading is where they're going to actually install these two pads as described in this area and this area to meet that definition of that policy 3.2.1 for the bonus node so they can get that fourth unit. And again, that's for the, enhan the enhancements that benefit the public realm. <coughs> David did show you a vicinity map and I'll, I'll go into it again, but the subject site is outlined in red. It's kind of like on this own little zoning lot minus the structure to the back, um, but all around it is single family residential. And I could show you some pictures, the subject site, the current, the current single family home. Most of it was fenced off. Um, it's obviously a larger site. There's the alleyway between, here's the subject site, and then the closest neighbor, and that neighbor would be to the east. And this is the other side of um, the alley. As you can see, it goes through. The rest of the photos are just the single family homes. I kind of went in a clockwise, uh, counterclockwise pattern around the, the block just to give you an idea. But again, they're all single family residential detached dwelling units. Um, so with that being said, the development review and compliance staff, we did review the application and we found the request consistent with the City of Tampa Land Development Code. Um, there are no waivers requested for this petition and should it be the pleasure of City Council to approve this application tonight on first reading. The minor modifications can be done between first and second reading of the revised revision sheet that I will turn in. And staff is available for any questions that you may have. Any questions at this time? Councilman Dingfelder. Thank you. Uh, Ryan, um, going back to the bonus provision, um, is there any guidance um, 
within within the language in the is it in the code or the comp plan um, you know they're they're going from three units to four units based, based upon that bonus clause um, I mean that you know that's a that's a huge benefit to to a developer and and yet in return you know they're, they're talking about two little benches like you know I could go to Home Depot and build for thirty dollars perhaps I don't know um, Council, so, if I can, you know what I, I would do? Because this is relevant, I, I would take that site plan revision sheet and make copies for Council because I believe you're asking an excellent question, Councilman Dinkfelder. This is, um, because this is Seminole Heights um, and the staff will tell you more about it, um, it is going to be a finding of Council to make that determination. That's part of your decision making. Right, so but, I'm but, but I wanted to know what, what, if any, guidance there was within the within the Seminole Heights code or within the comp plan to help us make that decision? Good question. And I'll get copies of that made for each of you. Ryan Manassi, and I'll try to answer your question, sir, and just please let me know if it doesn't, and I'll do my best. Um, so what I have on screen right here is that policy again. Here's the revision sheets. There's four of them. Mm -hmm. I didn't print out more than four, but. Um, so this is the, the Tampa Comprehensive Plan, and, and David did go over this policy 3.2.1, but so it's on screen, it's talking about that 25% per percent increase, and that's how they're getting this, through this node bonus, okay? And highlighted here as you go down through the pages, it's going to say, again, the enhanced land and streetscape and bicycle parking paths that enhance the quality of life and the public realm. Okay, so what was presented uh, between the agent and staff previously, um, there were some landscape improvement amenities and we didn't find that to be sufficient. So what they did, they proposed a, another iteration of some type of enhancement to the land and streetscape. And that was through these two um, pads that they're going to be installing, one being a pop-up library and one being a public bench. Um, again, this was reviewed by the zoning administrator as well as planning staff to determine that was consistent with the development. Um, this is a single family neighborhood, you know, single family detached neighborhood. So uh, staff felt that that was sufficient to meet the bonus node requirement uh, given this location. Okay, so uh, as an aside, I'll, I'll ask staff and legal to make a note about that policy and that we should revisit it when we, when we go back into our comp plan revisions because frankly, I think that's rather inadequate. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Anything else, sir? No, all right, applicant. Uh, good evening for the record, Kevin Reale, 401 East Jackson Street uh, for the applicant. I have a number of support letters and I also have some copies of my presentation if the council members would like to follow along, but I will be presenting on the Elmo as well. So I'll go through my first few slides pretty quickly here because staff has covered this in, in significant detail, but the, the property here is um, a block from some commercial property, uh, two blocks from Sly Avenue uh, in Seminole Heights between uh, Florida Avenue and 275. Um, I, I do have one more copy, yes. This is a, a closer aerial of the, uh, of the property. And as you'll note, uh, this commercial uh, uses here and uh, an alleyway and uh, the, just the general neighborhood. The, the uh, houses immediately surrounding that uh, staff showed are all single story, but the, the general area is a single story and two story homes. Again, the future land use map in here, uh, the only thing I'll note in addition to what was covered by staff is that the, the application here has a, a, a double lot and that doesn't really exist in the area. And that's so um, with a double lot with one home on it and uh, the other portion of the lot being vacant, this property is underutilized uh, as the comprehensive plan would, would consider things. And so that, that's part of the, the reason for the, the goal of the development here. Um, the, 
uh, goal for R10 is also to be pedestrian scale development, uh, single family residential scale, which includes single family accessory units and duplexes, and, which is what is proposed here. And then um, the Seminole, Nights, uh, Seminole Heights neighborhood and community node is the provision as stated, and as I'm sure we'll discuss more, what, which is the goal uh, to develop under. So to discuss that the community node goal more, the idea here is to offer a bonus, whether it be intensity or density, in these nodes so that uh, as this area redevelops, it puts uh, intensity, uh, or where, intensity and density where desired and where, where needed based on uh, how this was reviewed under the comprehensive plan. Um, the existing zoning in the area, uh, again, is stated by staff, so I uh, won't go over this too much, but just to point out that it is near some uh, public transportation options and near some uh, commercial general and residential office uses. So what you have in front of you, council members, uh, you know, of course, this isn't the plan size, but you'll be able to see the amenities included there in this picture. And again, no way was requested or proposed, uh, was proposed as two single family uh, detached, uh, semi-detached dwellings uh, with the setbacks as discussed by staff and um, no waivers are requested. So I do have our designer here tonight, uh, Mr. Alan Dobbs, and I'm gonna breeze over the design elements uh, pretty quickly because I think that's very important when we discuss how this is gonna fit into the neighborhood, and I actually think that that's uh, in a lot of ways more important than my portion of the presentation, but just to give an idea of the significant eff effort that was put into designing this to make sure that it fit in the character of the neighborhood and fit in the goals of the comp plan with this uh, density bonus, which. The density bonus is focused on the amenity, but uh, the goal is also to make sure that the scale fits in with the neighborhood. And the, the massing and bulk and scale does fit in the, uh, d the character of the neighborhood, including the significant design that was put into this at this early stage. Discussing the bonus uh, under the comp plan, it's actually referred to um, in, in 3.2.1 with a no bonus as, as an amenity. Um, uh, it, it was difficult to try and figure out what, what to do because it, this is a very uh, small development. Two lots uh, together adding one unit. I understand Mr. Dingfelder's point that there is, uh, you know, one unit would be 25% difference, but it's still a small scale development. The landowner now is planning to develop and live in it and lives in the property now and uh, wants to remain in the, in the neighborhood. And so uh, given the, the area, uh, some type of amenity that might be available on a much larger project, like uh, perhaps a park or something, just, just didn't really work. But what's notable in the area is there's no sidewalks uh, anywhere around here. So as redevelopment comes through, the goal will be to, uh, or not the goal, the requirement of the code will be to include those sidewalks and eventually make this a more walkable community. This being essentially the first step in, of that in, in uh, this area, the idea was to focus on those sidewalks and add in uh, this bench and the, the pop-up library. Uh, understanding it, it is it is modest compared to what might be seen in a larger development, but uh, it is it is not uh, a very large development. And uh, what we also had is Mr. Dobbs went into the neighborhood. He's very active there and has uh, lived there for a number of years and uh, discussed with some members of the neighborhood how they felt about it and generally was able to have support for that. Discussing the vision statements, and I'll go over these briefly, but. Uh, the vision statements talk about integrating uses and creating walkability, and this development will do both of those things. Um, that also encourages multi-use options, and uh, this would be a different use and another housing option in the area, which is also uh, encouraged by the, the comprehensive plan. Uh, it's gonna protect the existing character. The significant goal uh, to protect the character was put into the design to make sure that this wouldn't be something that would stick out in the neighborhood, and in fact, I think that um, what Mr. Dahls will show it fits in quite well and then creative parking, and so the parking is designed into this, and so you don't have, you don't have a lot so, sort of uh, on one portion of the property. It's integrated uh, throughout. The staff report from the uh, Planning Commission staff listed uh, quite a number of comprehensive plan policies that are encouraged, actually m many more than what I have shown here because this devel development is unique, and with that uniqueness comes a lot uh, of um, extra policies that are supportive, but I want to focus on some design policies and the next slide, some, some planning policies. So, so picking those out, the design goal, when, like I've been repeating here, is a lot of effort on the design, is to enhance the urban neighborhood character, 
uh, to make sure that the development is in harmony with new and old structures, to make sure that alleys, which are part of the historic Tampa neighborhoods, are still utilized. The project will do all of those things. Uh, additionally, the, the scale is mitigated through the design and it's oriented to the sidewalk on Navin Street. Uh, additionally, discussing planning, this is infill development using an underutilized yacht, the uh, lot. The um, bonus used is, uh, is provided for with the amenity, but also with the design. The design is a big part of that, and there's a lot of effort to make sure that it's integrated with the surrounding character of the area. It's generally near the periphery of the neighborhood, uh, but to the extent it's not, it's well integrated through its design. And uh, it also meets the goals to uh, infill in the nodes and to accommodate housing growth and encourage housing um, diversity. So uh, in conclusion, I'll just uh, reiterate, as, as the council knows, staff, planning commission, and um, city staff support this. And now I'll have um, Mr. Dobbs come up and discuss in more detail of the design. See, okay, here we go. Okay, my name is Alan Dobbs. I live, or yeah, I live at 5502 North uh, Cherokee Avenue, um, and I have been sworn. I moved, my wife and I moved into the neighborhood in uh, early uh, uh, 1990. Uh, I was in uh, the architecture school at USF, um, which is actually Architecture School of and Community Design. <clears throat> And I was very interested in Seminole Heights and got very active in the, in the neighborhood way back when we were just, it was just becoming a historic district. So obviously um, it has become a very desirable place to live and it's undergone a lot of changes. Uh, Seminole Heights, um, you know, started out as one of Tampa's first uh, suburbs. And then, um, and then over the years, you know, it's gone through uh, a lot of evolution becoming a historic district. Uh, but one of the things is, um, you know, there's a lack of diversity in some of the heights. There's a lot of diversity with architectural styles and things like that, but there's mostly single family detached homes and very little uh, multifamily. So um, with multifamily and more dense projects, what is the kind of appropriate development? Well, we've gone from having nothing to some fairly significant structures, you know, like 80 and 100 units, um, you know, in our neighborhood. So we've drastically uh, changed a lot. So, so I felt, or we felt that this project is a good way to sort of show providing a little bit more density, but still keep with the scale uh, and um, proportion, setback orientation, and other things that are typical, you know, in the neighborhood. Um, I wanted to show some different housing types here. Something other than just single family residential. I don't know if the camera can zoom in just a little bit because the pictures are a little small, but okay. So this is actually a duplex or a paired villa. Uh, there's two units there. It's one story, very simple. So there's several of those in the neighborhood in some of the heights. Um, Mediterranean style is another very common style. This is actually a courtyard and ha I think it has three, either two or four units in it. But then when we get a little bit um, uh, denser units, there's several, well, this, this property just sold recently, but there's, there's others that are like around uh, eight units. This is probably a little more than eight units. Um, but then there's, uh, there's also townhouses. This is not obviously in Seminole Heights, but these I show is what we want to avoid. These are basically, uh, you know, townhomes or single family attached homes. Uh, you know, the vehicle is very prominent, which is typically not desirable. And then also just the form of the building, it's very square and plain, no porch. Porches are very desirable in Seminole Heights. Uh, this was a, um, a townhome that the zoning here was actually residential multifamily 
um, it's in Seminole Heights, and it, you see how the massing is broken down, and it's sort of in the scale and character of the neighborhood, and it was built on a, uh, I think it was an RS-60 lot at the time. I mean, not RS-60, it's RM, but it, 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 it met all the requirements of the zoning code. Um, with the new uh, code in Seminole Heights, all the SH um, uh, form-based code that we have now, uh, single family attached uh, is another uh, option, which is what this is. This was built probably about four or five years ago, um, and it's basically two units. It's like a townhome, and then there's a detached garage in the back. Um, then going up in density, you know, these were some uh, townhomes that were built near Giddens in Florida. Uh, more density. These were about four to five units, and then and then we jump and scale to some of these newer units. This is at Giddens of Florida. You know, has about almost 30 units, and then um, and then this is the Height Apartments at uh, Idlewild in Florida. It's really dense, um, 81 units, and you can see the scale of it here. Um, this particular project, um, what I'm going to go. Let's see. Just checking on the on the time. Um, can the camera go to that site plan over there? If I walk over there, can it? Yeah. Yes, it can. It's, it's it on. It can. Okay, and I can kind of see it. Okay, I wanted to show this because I think it helps to see the green, so you see it more in a figure ground sort of way. Uh, because with the development, doing the two sort of paired villas or or uh, attached units, we maximize green space. And then also, you'll note large porches, port cashiers, those are very desirable elements in the neighborhood. Uh, parking was very tricky to accommodate two uh, spaces per unit, but um, it worked out pretty well to have these two interior units to have parking to port cashiers. Um, and rather than having parking in a port cashier here, we have the units in the back, the two-story units. So it's almost, it's attached, but it's like a detached garage. Uh, it does have its own separate entry, um, so that it makes a great home office, which now with COVID and everything, that's very desirable. But also there was a trend before COVID where people were working at home. And so that worked out well for that. And then also the interior units also have a, um, a second floor, smaller unit that's accessible uh, here. Uh, we're improving the alley and we're doing sidewalks all the way around. These amenities on the corner, uh, I, I know all the people on the Old Seminole Heights Neighbor Association board uh, talked with um, them and to look at, uh, you know, discuss what kind of amenities would be proper and, you know, the, everybody seemed to like the, uh, just doing a bench. We talked about a dog uh, watering station or something like that. Uh, it does get a little tricky because you have um, private development for public use. So we we were a little concerned about the property owner and liability, but we figured just having a paved area and a bench and maybe something like a, um, the pop-up library. Uh, there's two within a half a mile of the of this property, and they're they're very popular. Um, and. So I'm going to try and wrap it up because I think we're getting short here on time. So um, basically, my clients wanted to, uh, you know, develop the property into something that they could use, uh, but also they wanted to create a unique hybrid type of housing that could maybe set a precedent on, on a little more dense development, but, but keep the character and scale of the neighborhood, which I believe we've done. Um, and, and with the way it's done, it's less cost because you have a shared construction wall, you have a lot of flexibility because these are all fee simple, so you could build, say, two of them, and then, which is what they're planning on doing, build the two on the south first while they live in their house, and then tear their house down and build the other two. Um, it, and it makes it easy for phasing and also because of, the, of it being fee simple properties. And then it accommodates modern lifestyles, like I had mentioned with the, the uh, sort of home office. Um, the, with the design solution, we really, can I have just like one minute? Okay, I'll, I'll make this quick on just the last couple lines here. So we really wanted to downplay vehicular. Um, the cars de-emphasize them, maximize size of porches and green space. And we've, uh, we meet the requirements of all of the Seminole Heights um, form-based zoning code. We're not requesting any waivers. And then, like I said before, the 
public amenity. We got a lot of input from the Neighborhood Association and they are all uh, very happy to uh, have that kind of amenity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I yes, sir. make one comment? Of course. Mr. Dobbs, uh, I want to apologize. The, uh, the, the, the project looks really nice and sensitive to the, to the community and I kind of poo-pooed the bench um, more out of frustration with our code that doesn't really require you or anybody else to make significant contributions. So out of that frustration came my comment and I apologize. Well, it was for the good of the neighborhood and the community, so I understand. Okay. Thank you very much. Anybody else have any questions or comments? All right. Is there anybody in the Mr. public? Mr. Chairman? Yes? Uh, David with the Planning Commission. I just, since um, there was a discussion about the comp plan policies, I just wanted to provide some context, mm -hmm. um, if I may. The, the, when we look at neighborhood policy 3.2.1, that's the enabling language that basically allows this consideration for the node. This came out of, and the applicant did um, mention this, it did come out of the 2009 uh, city visioning study for Seminola Heights. Um, if we look at the overall objective, three uh, neighborhood objective 3.2, which is also contained in the Planning Commission report, it does direct um, that land development regulations be developed to deal with these um, infill and the amenities that they're to provide. Um, I'm not sure that was accomplished, and that is what's leading to um, the vagueness about the amenities. Now, I will say, you, usually uh, the comp plan is not where the details um, really should be focused on. That's more appropriate in the land development code. So I just wanted to uh, address uh, Councilman Dingfelder's concerns earlier about the comp plan policies relating to the land development code and the amenities. And I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could I, could I add just one short point to that? Just sure. Very specific to that. So uh, it's my understanding this is the first time this, is, this node bonus has ever been used for residential. Um, and so when it's been used for commercial intensity bonuses, what's typically happened is it's been a, a pay to play situation. Um, I, 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 have, I don't want to speak too much to the commercial parts because I haven't reviewed that in any more detail than what I've just stated. But um, you know, to, to the extent that this um, this is novel, you know, this is uh, you know staff and the applicant trying to work together and figure out how to how to make that work. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Do we have anybody in the public that wishes to speak on this item? Item number thirteen. Hearing or seeing none, I know we have three registered speakers online. If they're online, uh, if you could turn on your cameras and unmute yourselves, and we will swear you in, and then we'll get to the public comment. All right, I see Brittany. Do we have Tyler McMahon and Allie? They're currently not logged on. Okay, so Brittany, if you could please raise your right hand, and we'll swear you in, and you have three minutes to speak. You swear or affirm you'll tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. All right, go ahead. Um, hi, I don't think I'll take up three minutes. Um, I live right across the street. Um, one of the pictures that the last gentleman showed um, was looking right at their driveway, which is what we see from our driveway. So. It'll be right across the street from us. Um, my husband, two children, we live here. We've lived here for five and a half years. Um, and we support um, what Laura is wanting to do. Um, we think that the addition of the town hall will be a great opportunity for more um, families, young people to come to the area. Um, we like that the design idea fits the theme of the neighborhood. Um, and yeah, we support it. And being so close to it, we are fine with it. All right, and your name just for the record? Brittany Gisto, and we live at 6806 North Central Avenue. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Do we have anybody else for public comment, or that was it? That concludes the registered speaker. All right. 
If there is uh, no other public comment, petitioner, if you have uh, any rebuttal at this time. Um, I don't know that we would re rebut support, but uh, just to point out, I think I buried the lead a little bit. Mr. Dingfelder got me a little focused on the node uh, bonus, but uh, the applicant is here, and it's, it's really important to note that the applicant the applicant's going to live here, potentially her father's going to live in one of the units, and these are going to be fee units. This isn't going to be a developer, develop, and leave situation, and I think that that's uh, important to note. Thank you. Sorry, I, I would just like to uh, follow up just with one thing. Um, knowing a lot of residents in Seminole Heights, if anybody had issues with this, they would definitely be here. And I think this council knows from previous projects, if the neighborhood doesn't like something or doesn't agree with something, they would be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments from council before I ask for a motion to close? Move close. Motion to close from Second. Councilman Good, Second from Councilman Citro. All in favor? Aye. All right, any opposed? Council Member Goods, would you mind taking item number 13? Thank you, Chairman. REZ-20-21. Substitute order has been presented for first reading consideration the ordinance rezoning property in the general vicinity of 6805 North Navin Avenue in the city of Tampa, Florida, and more particularly described in section one, the zoning district classification SH uh, RS, Seminole Heights Residential Single Family, to SHPD, Single Heights Plan Development, Residential Single Family, semi-detached, semi providing an effective date. Second. Second. Mr. Shelby. And, Ms. and uh, Councilman uh, Goods, if you could just add the uh, additional language for item number 13. That's the revision. <coughs> yeah, that's and that's the revision sheet you're talking to, Mr. Shelby? Well, is, is, the, is there a revision sheet related to this? <coughs> It's it's the, yes, it's the revised revision sheet. The revised sheet. revision the revised sheet that was passed. Revision revision sheet. Sheet. Yes. And the revised revision sheet. Okay. And also, um, could you make a specific finding as to any policy 3.2.1 as to the amenities and the bonus? Is it, what is council's intention with regard to that? To accept that revision sheet as the amenity under that section and to permit the bonus under the comp that plan would be correct, Mr. That would be correct, Mr. Shelby. Okay, to subdivision sheet with the bonuses. Do we have a second? <coughs> second. Second from Councilman Citro. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Sorry. It was unanimous. Roll call. Okay. The motion carried with Carlson being absent. Second reading and adoption will be on January 14th at 9.30 a.m. I apologize, I did not hear the vote. <laughs> no, it's okay. That we all, all right. need some uh, caffeine, Mr. Chairman. That's right. <laughs> um, all right, we go up to number 14, and uh, I'm just gonna hand the gavel to Councilman Citro. I'm gonna step out a minute. Thank you very much. Do we have the petitioner here? Oh, sorry. Mr. Oh, go ahead, I'm Councilman, sorry. Uh, Susan Johnson Velez, uh, Senior Assistant City Attorney. Council members, this um, matter is before you this evening pursuant to Land Development Code Section 27 318, which authorizes Council to consider the suspension or revocation of alcoholic beverage sales for cause. Um, a while back, I delivered to, to each of you a notebook that provides some evidence for this hearing, which um, um, if you'd like to follow along, a copy of the code section that I just referenced. 27-318 is at tab 21 of those binders. So specifically, section 27-318C1, which starts near the bottom of page three of six, again at tab 21, authorizes city council, after conducting a public hearing, to suspend or revoke the ability to sell alcoholic beverages from property which has previously been granted in approval. In order for city council to suspend or revoke, it must determine that the property owner holder of the alcoholic beverage license, operator of the establishment, or any agent or employee thereof had been found to have violated or been convicted of any one or more of the following. And then that section lists a laundry list of A through N of, of various um, reasons why you could consider suspension or revocation for cause. But specifically with regard to this um, notice of suspension or revocation this evening, um, there are several that, that are particularly relevant. So um, one is section D or paragraph D, which 
allows you to suspend for cause upon finding that there has been operation of the establishment in a manner that repeatedly or on an ongoing basis has negative secondary effects on surrounding property after having received reasonable notice to terminate or correct that condition. Number E, failing to comply with any of the provisions of the fire prevention ordinance, again, after having received reasonable notice to eliminate or correct any condition existing on the property. F, failing to comply with any of the provisions of the health and sanitation ordinances of the city, the county, or laws of the state after receiving reasonable notice um, to eliminate or correct the condition. And then N, violated any section of Chapter 14 or Chapter 27, any condition, limitation, or restriction imposed by City Council or the Zoning Administrator at the time of approval or any other City Code section relating to alcoholic beverages. The circumstances giving rise to these proceedings occurred largely in May of 2020, and they're detailed in the Notice of Intent to Revoke or Suspend the Sale of Alcoholic Beverages pursuant to section 27-318 that's dated May 28th, 2020, and can be found at tab one of your binders. So during this time period, numerous governor's executive orders, which can be found at tab 19, were also in effect. We had executive order number 20-51, which was issued on March 1st, 2020, which directed the Florida Department of Health to issue a public health emergency related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Executive Order Number 20-52, issued on March 9, 2020, declared a state of emergency for the entire state of Florida in connection with COVID-19. Executive Order Number 20-68, issued on March 17, 2020, ordered all bars, pubs, and nightclubs authorized to sell alcoholic beverages for consumption on premises that derive more than 50% of their gross revenue from the sale of alcoholic beverages to suspend all sales of alcoholic beverages for 30 days. The governor also issued executive order number 20-91 on April 1st, 2020, which directed all persons in Florida to limit, limit their movements and personal interactions outside of their home to only those necessary to obtain or provide essential services or conduct essential activities. So as you may recall, as we approach the end of April and in preparation for reopening the state, the governor issued executive order number 20-12, allowing a partial reopening, the phase one reopening, it was commonly known as, and that order was effective on May 4th, 2020. So phase one allowed the reopening of restaurants and food establishments licensed under chapters 500 and 509 of the Florida statutes for on-premises consumption of food and beverage so long as they adopt appropriate social distancing measures and limit their indoor occupancy to no more than 25% of their building occupancy. And appropriate social distancing was defined in that order to require maintaining a minimum of six feet between parties, only seating parties of 10 or fewer people, and keeping bar counters closed to seating. Executive Order Number 20-123, issued on May 18, 2020, increased the capacity of restaurants to 50% if the same social distancing conditions that I just described were met. Previously, on May 8, 2020, the governor had issued Executive Order Number 20-14, which had extended the state of emergency for another 60 days. And pursuant to state statutes, these executive orders, because they were declared during a state of emergency, had the force and effect of law. So again, just to summarize those, all those executive orders, um, from May 4th to May 18th, restaurants could be open at 25% of occupancy with a minimum of six feet between parties, 10 or fewer people, and bar counters were closed to seating. After May 18th, those restaurants could be open at 50% capacity, again, with the same social distancing. But during this time period, bars um, and pubs and, and, and those types of establishments were to suspend the sales of alcoholic beverages. In addition to the state emergency order, the city was also under a declaration of local emergency pursuant to the mayor's executive order 20-01, originally issued on March 12, 2020, but which has been amended, restated, and extended each week, most recently this past Monday, December 7th of 2020. So I'd like now to ask uh, LaShawn Dock with um, Development and Growth Management to come forward with a synopsis of the existing approvals on the property. Um, yes, good evening, Council. LaShawn Dock, Development Coordination. 
And um, I'd like to review with you the um, alcohol beverage sales approval for this location. So this request, um, the AB sales was approved back in April of 2014. The request um, was actually approved under record number AB 114-67. This is for alcoholic beverage sales for a bar, beer, wine, liquor, for consumption on premise only. This building contains two levels. So the first level was included in the alcoholic beverage sales area. That first level is the interior space. And the rooftop level is that second level. It is an exterior space. So the approved sales area consists of a total of 3,000 491 square feet, and that's inside space only. No outdoor space was permitted. The sidewalk cafe approval was granted for this location. Sidewalk cafe approval is a separate application and it is an annual permit that is issued. The approval contained one condition, and I will read to you that condition which was stated on the approved site plan also. The use shall operate as an establishment whose business is in the preparation, serving, and selling of food to the customer for immediate consumption on or in the vicinity of the premises or for takeout by customers. Food shall be continuously ready to be prepared, served, and sold during all business operational hours. Establishment shall be appropriately licensed as a restaurant or similar food service type use by the state of Florida. Reporting requirements set forth in section 27.319 shall not apply. So also I'd like to mention council for this location. There are two pending applications um, for the site. So the first is a 180 day voluntary extension. And the second application that is in process is for a new special use one alcoholic beverage sales application. Those two applications are still in process currently. And to orient to orient you on the site, I'd just like to show an aerial of the site. So, so this is the site located on Franklin Street, identified in red. This is Tampa Street on the west. This is Fortune Street to the north and Royal Street. Um, this is Florida Avenue to the east, and this is the site identified in red, 1202 Franklin. This is a view just showing the south end of the structure. This is the front of the building, and this is a view from the other side. The second level, which is the outdoor area, which is not covered for alcoholic beverage sales, that is the area that is here. And then this is the first level of the structure. And that concludes the presentation on the current sales. Yes, Council, I'd also like to mention, I'm sorry, that the letter, based upon information received to our office from um, surrounding neighbors, um, a letter was issued to the business operator. We issued a letter, it went out to the business, it went out to the business owner and it went out to the property owner. Um, we also had this notice letter issued um, by hand by TPD. This was a notice of intent to revoke or suspend the sale of alcoholic beverages pursuant to section 27-318, City of Tampa Land Development Code. This was issued on May 28, 2020. And that letter went out um, to all of those mentioned. It went into the permit history of the site and the requirements for compliance for the site. And that was um, submitted and delivered to the locations as indicated. And do you wanna? Just, just to add to that, and I, I did wanna, because um, I neglected to mention, but in, um, the notice of intent is um, at tab one that you can see on the letter if you're if you're reading along. The, the business is actually called Mole y Abuela. The business owner and the alcoholic beverage license holder is an LLC called Maya Tampa LLC. 
and the property owner at the time that the notice was issued was a comp was an LLC called Paranos LLC, but um, I believe as of um, June or July of this year, the property was sold to an entity called 1201 Franklin Holdings LLC. So there is a different property owner, but the business owner and AB license holder, Maya Tampa, um, is still the, still the business owner of this establishment. So behind tab 10 in your binders, there is a um, chronology of events and violations. Um, they're outlined in page, um, page four of the notice of intent, and they go on for um, two or three pages beyond that. And then at tab 10, there's included a summary of a compilation of all the numerous calls that TPD received during the month of May for this establishment, as well as all the police reports um, that are reflected, um, that were prepared by the officers that responded. And so all, all of those show we believe, and I do have um, a couple of TPD officers here who will be um, providing some testimony in a few moments, but as I stated earlier, um, the phase one reopening started on May 4th and right out of the box on May 5th and 6th, um, there was unreasonably loud and excessive noise. Um, by May 8th and 9th, there were lines out of the door of the establishment, there was no social distancing. Um, in violation of the executive orders. Tables had been removed from within the establishment, so um, apparently they weren't serving food. Um, there was no service, food service that was going on, again, in violation of the city's condition of approval and also the executive orders. Um, mid middle of May, May 14th through 15th, they were over the 25% capacity that was required to be followed. They were not following social distancing requirements. There was unreasonably excessive noise in violation of Land Development Code Section 14-54. Again, May 15th through 16th, TPD advised the security manager of the numerous violations. Um, the establishment had been converted into a club and was over 100% capacity. Um, and the officer noted that the security manager seemed to have an excuse for every violation. Again, on May 16th and 17th of 2020, uh, the officer noted that the establishment has completely violated all of the state and local executive orders. The bar was open at full capacity. Drinks were being actively served at the bar in violation of Executive Order 20-112. There was no maintaining of social distancing. Uh, TPD noted that the owner was uncooperative and did not appear to care about follow following the guidelines at all. May 19th through 20th of 2020, over 100% capacity in violation of occupancy limits and in violation of the special use approval and the city fire marshal's occupancy limits. There was no maintaining of social distancing and again, unreasonably loud and excessive noise. May 22nd through 23rd of 2020, there was blatant social distancing violations that were noted uh, severely over the 50% capacity requirements in violation of executive order 20-123. On May 24th, Tampa Fire Rescue investigators were on site and observed that patrons were not following any social distancing guidelines. Most of the patrons were standing and not eating any food. Um, at approximately 10 o'clock, um, about 20 patrons were noted drinking alcoholic beverages on the rooftop in violation of the city's approval. Also on that date, the, there was a north side gate exit to the stairwell that leading up to the rooftop was padlock closed with occupants upstairs, and this was noted as a life safety code violation. On May 26 of 2020, again, the establishment had exceeded the max, maximum occupancy. Um, they were over the 50% capacity requirements in violation of the executive order. There was no maintaining of social distancing. Uh, Tampa Police Department was denied entry into the establishment in violation of state statute. Customers were standing at and were being served alcoholic beverages from the inside and outside bars. And then finally, on May 28th or 29th, uh, management advised TPD that they were only going to comply with the original occupancy permit, not the COVID guidelines. Um, at 11.10 p.m. that evening, um, officers observed the atmosphere had again turned from a restaurant to a bar and patrons were um, drinking alcoholic beverages around the bar and throughout the restaurant. And so this, um, all these reports and the officers who will testify in just a moment, um, you know, established just um, numerous violations, um, no attempt by the uh, operator, the property owner, or any agent or employee to comply with these um, regulations. And so at this time, I'd like to call um, Lieutenant Travis Moss with the Tampa Police Department to come forward. Um, the first few pages behind tab 10 
our Lieutenant Moss's compilation of uh, TPD reports uh, during the month of May, and so he's going to describe those just briefly. Good evening, Council. My name is uh, Travis Moss. I'm a lieutenant with the Tampa Police Department. Try to be as brief as possible. Uh, before we begin, I would like to say that I was never at Molly Abuela, so I can't answer anything on these nights. But what I was uh, ordered to do was to compile the information. So what you see on this report that uh, starts May 22, 23, and goes backwards chronologically to May 5th uh, is all pulled off of our computer-aided dispatch system, which is through the Versadex computer system. So <clears throat> all I did was basically review the uh, address 1202 North Franklin Street, and then I documented each one of these uh, calls. So if you look, for instance, uh, an easy one is uh, May 21, 22, where it says TPD number 20-256008. That is the, uh, the assigned number or event number to that call. So uh, if somebody calls in, when they called in this, uh, this complaint, that's the number that was automatically assigned to it. It was cataloged by the, the uh, call taker as a disturbance music, um, and then meaning uh, when, the, when the call taker heard the complainant, they knew, that, hey, that they're complaining about the noise. Um, it was on uh, May 21st, and then 22, 10 hours, obviously military time. That was at 10, 10 p.m. Uh, it was loud music and talking. What you see that is written in uh, capital letters is the actual CAD call note itself. So that's the call taker taking the call from the complainant. They ship it to the dispatcher, and that was actually what was received by the officers um, that went out to this, uh, this particular call. So loud music and talking from this location. That's basically what the officers knew. Uh, and of course, by this point, we had already known that this place was a problem because we'd been out there several times. Um, and I only did this from the 23rd back to the 5th, looking, uh, <clears throat> looking, at, the, um, looking at my computer while we're waiting for this, I realized there was actually 14 more calls between the 23rd to the 31st. And then there was actually 18 self-initiated um, act, uh, events, which is basically an officer putting themselves out there uh, to go and review. So what they were doing is, and I think uh, Officer Mathis is going to testify to that shortly, is they were going out there almost hourly every night to check the, because we had so many complaints. So um, if there's any questions from council. Do we have any questions at this time? No, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir, Councilman Good. Well, uh, Officer Moss, uh, Lieutenant, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. In, any arrests in this case, in any of these cases at the uh, uh, seven? No, no, sir, I don't believe there's any arrests. Uh, from what I've seen, there were seven reports and 10 street checks that were, uh, were written, but I don't I believe there's any arrests. I saw the street checks. Okay, thank you, sir. Yes, sir, thank you. Thank you. I'd now, I'd now like to ask um, Officer Lee Matheson to testify about his encounters with the Mola e Abuela establishment. Good evening, Council. Officer Lee Matheson with the Tampa Police Department. I'm uh, assigned as the crime prevention officer in the area, so a lot of the problems usually get assigned to me so I can heal, uh, deal with them with a, kind of a personal touch. Um, I was assigned this a business by uh, my lieutenant at the time, uh, Lieutenant Ron Polk, and what we were beginning to notice is that there were a lot of noise complaints. Um, uh, we were getting disturbances in terms of people actually fighting in the area, um, and specifically we are also getting uh, COVID complaints as well. People were complaining about social distancing. Um, they were over capacity, um, just violating pretty much any restriction that was put in place at this time. Um, I started uh, responding to this business on an hourly basis, I believe on the shift of the 23rd. Um, and initially, we were greeted with somewhat cooperation. Uh, the business owners and managers nodded their head and agreed, yes, we will follow what you need to, with a smile on their face. Um, but shortly thereafter, it uh, fell off. They continued 
to say, yes, we will follow the restrictions, we will follow the restrictions shift after shift and after shift. And there continue to be violations upon violations upon violations each and every shift. Um, specifically, what I noticed going through, <coughs> reading back to the, the COVID guidelines, um, they were not supposed to be operating as a nightclub because nightclubs at this point were not open for business, period. Um, they were not supposed to be operating as that as all. And as they were open as a restaurant early in the evening, they did convert into a typical nightclub around 9 p.m. They would shut off or they would have everyone leave the resident or leave the business, I'm sorry. And they would take out all the tables, all the chairs, set up a DJ, have a, according even to them, a dance floor, and they would serve people alcohol directly from the bar, which again was a specific COVID violation. They were not supposed to be doing that, period. Um, in addition to that, I was getting numerous noise complaints from nearby residents, and I issued them two specific warnings, um, documented warnings and street checks due to their noise complaints that were, uh, again, in violation of the city ordinance. Um, going forward, I was also the officer who is issued them their cease and desist order, um, I believe it was called, on the 29th at approximately uh, 1840 hours, which is uh, 640 p.m. I met with two managers at that time who uh, I provided a copy to, of them to that order. And they also signed uh, our copy, initialing that they understood what was going on. I answered as many questions as I possibly could for them to the best of my ability. When I responded back later that evening, um, I spoke with the self-described owner of the, res uh, of the of the property, uh, Franco Pescante, I believe, and he advised that he had been on the phone with his lawyer for approximately the last three hours, um, and his lawyer had indicated to him that they were not going to follow the cease and desist order in terms of the consumption of alcohol on the rooftop. They were going to cease the sale of alcohol on the rooftop, but they were going to, in essence, sell alcohol on the lower story and then the customer themselves would bring it up to the uh, top for consumption. When I did my hourly walkthroughs, this is what I noted as well. They appeared to have removed from the upstairs bar area all their alcohol bottles. I did not see a bartender up top, but there were numerous people each time still drinking upstairs despite being advised that uh, their business was not supposed to be doing this. Um, even continuing to this point, we were still getting, we will follow this, we will, we will adhere to your guidelines, but immediately when we would come back for the same violations, shift after shift, um, there was no indication that they were actually going to follow us, or follow the guidelines, and it seemed like they were just placating us. Um, I'd be fine to answer any questions that the council might have, as I was officer primarily assigned to this area. Any questions for the gentleman? Yes, sir. Councilman Dean Uh Officer Matheson, um, how, where is your zone? Where, how, how far, you know, where do you, where do you cover? Uh, so for District 3, I cover all of Sector F as a crime prevention officer. So I'll respond to Ebor, downtown, um, you know, as far east as pretty much the jail, whatever problems that may occur. Okay, and and during this COVID period, um, have there been other establishments that that you've uh, you've had to give uh, warnings to, or or you know that sort of thing? Uh, yes, sir. I've I've had to give warnings to several other businesses as well. Okay, and what sort of response? Uh, and those other those other establishments, uh, you know, did you get? Uh, primarily, the issue at this time was Mole Abuela, um, but when the nightclubs had started opening and Ebor began to reopen itself, it was capacity restrictions with the nightclubs. And when you gave those warnings, um, did they the other establishments did they respond? positively and, and correct the, um, the concerns that you had? 
some of them did, and some of them sin still continued to violate. I couldn't hear the end. Sorry. Some of them responded and made the correct changes to follow the guidelines and the ordinance and the orders, and some of them did not. Okay. Um, and, and in your opinion, um, as related to the total of the all the institutions that you investigated and, and spoke to, et cetera, um, where does uh, Mole Abuela uh, fit, um, you know, in the, the worst, the middle, the, you know, whatever? They were by far the most egregious violator, far and away, not even remotely close. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? No? All right, thank you very much. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to ask uh, Tampa Fire Rescue Investigator Frank Rossetti to come forward and testify about his experience with Mole Restaurant. Good evening, Council. My name is Frank Rossetti. I work for Tampa Fire Rescue as an investigator, fire investigator, and I uh, want to make two occurrences, uh, one referencing May 24th. Um, I was tasked or assigned to assist my TPD brothers in entering abuelas for the purpose of the violations of possible fire code violations that might have been going on there because of occupant overloading also during the pandemic uh, restrictions. And specifically, the 24th for me was noted because that's the day as was read here already that they were having some patrons on the uh, rooftop, um, which requires you to go up a stairwells. One is an interior stairwell of the building and one is the north stairwell that is also on an exit discharge. That's the north side exit gate that I <coughs> observed being locked with a padlock, which is obviously a fire safety or a life safety issue. A business has to be, all their exits have to be readily open and available for people to leave. If in a case of an emergency, uh, when I questioned one of the managers, who I believe is like the manager, the doorman manager, he said, oh yeah, we have the key. So I asked them to produce the key. It took them about five minutes to go find the key. I did not necessarily find them. The business at that time, I just educated them on hey, if you're going to have the stairs upstairs open or if your business is going to be open at all, you need to have all your exits open and unlocked and easily accessible for the patrons that may be impaired to exit safely. Um, again, as everybody else mentioned, yes, sir, we'll do what we need to. I understand it won't be an issue again. So at that time, I just documented it and we were informed at approximately 22, 30 hours, so 10, 30 hours uh, civilian time. Uh, they stated we business wasn't that busy, so we're just going to shut down for the evening, um, prompting us to probably leave and not do the hourly checks as we've been instructed to do so. When that occurred, I observed about 15 or 20 people standing in front of the door waiting to enter the occupancy load. I will also state that on that particular day, the business was not overcrowded to their maximum capacity of 100% is 196 allowable total. I believe in the notes, um, they're allowed to have 60 occupants in the upstairs portion and 136 in the downstairs portion under normal conditions. When we were operating under the COVID conditions, this was the time where the 50% rule was in effect. But we weren't, we didn't violate them at that time because they were under their 50% that day. So on May 27th, again, I was uh, tasked and assigned to assist TPD with their hourly uh, walkthroughs. Um, the first few hours of the day, we started about 9 o'clock or so, 9.30. Uh, low crowd, everybody cooperative. 
were no issues noted from a fire safety point of view. Um, later in the evening, um, the crowd started getting larger. Uh, we approached at approximately 2,300 hours, so 11 o'clock in the evening. Uh, we approached the doorman. There was a, a large crowd gathering in the front door. They weren't occupying the, applying the social distance guidelines, the six foot rule. I asked the doorman, could he give me a count of how many people were in the nightclub at this particular time? And he indicated that there were 96 people. Obviously that wasn't the case. So at that time, I called my fire marshal and told him that they were exceeding their 169 or 196 occupancy, which is their 100% occupancy on a, under a normal, no COVID restriction. And we, what we call, we didn't shut them down, but we called dump the building. So I evacuated the entire building and started a head count. Officers went in with their body worn cameras. They observed about 286 people total in the building. As we started to physically, now mind you at this point when I announced the shutdown, several people had left the rooftop, went out the side um, stairwell, so we didn't count those. But the physical people we actually counted coming out of the building was about 205 patrons, which included 30 staff members approximately. Uh, this total came out to 255. Their allowable limit is 196. At that point, I told the management <clears throat> that we were going to let them continue to stay open, but I was only going to allow them to have 100 people in the business. So basically, do simple math. You're allowed 196, rounded up to 200, divided in half. That's the 50% corona requirement. I counted 100, I had a briefing with the staff and informed them that if this obviously continued, that the fire marshal's office could pull their occupancy load sign and shut their business down until they started complying. Everybody understood, everybody was pleasant. We let 100 people back in and that it, I actually concluded my involvement with that situation. <clears throat> Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Council members, I do want to call your attention to, to um, tab 14 in your notebooks. I just want to put a, a few photos on the Elmo. I think we, um, the person who took these photos is um, waiting to speak to, to you. Um, he's one of the surrounding neighbors, but I'll put this up on the Elmo and just show you um, kind of a representative picture of what the crowds <laughs> look like. So that's the front of Mole y Abuela, and you can see that um, quite a number of people there, no social distancing. And that's the picture, this is a picture of the rooftop area of the restaurant. Ms. Velez? Yes, sir. When the uh Fire investigator talks about the number of occupancy. Is that include of, uh, of the rooftop, or is that just the inside of the facility that's packed? I believe he was speaking of both the rooftop and the inside, but he'll he can answer that. Yes, sir. I, I, the question was uh, what it, the occupancy load being 196 persons allowed in the establishment. That is the total amount. The downstairs is allowed to have 136, the interior portion of the, of the business. The rooftop, the space on the rooftop is allowed to have the other 60 personnel. So total in the square footage or the footprint of that building would be 196 total personnel. Occupant. Thank you, that's why I was looking at the videos here. Today. So it's, oh. their, their occupancy sign has a split code like you know like you go outside the, like right there the door you see the occupants and maximum load and if you divide that out so in that business you have a downstairs that says 60 and the upstairs says or excuse me upstairs 60 downstairs 136 thank you sir so council per 
Section 27-318, again, council may suspend the ability to sell alcoholic beverages for up to 30 days for a first violation. So this would be a first violation, that's the maximum amount of time of the suspension. And in determining whether to suspend or revoke an approval to sell alcoholic beverages, um, city council shall consider the gravity of the violation, any actions taken by the violator to correct the violation, as well as any previous violations committed by the violator. So based on the evidence in your in the notebook and that um, in the record and the evidence and testimony presented this evening and considering the gravity of the violations, including the significant number of violations as well as the, you know, the impacts of public health and safety as a result of the violation or the many violations of the, of the COVID um, restrictions, as well as the fact that the violator took no actions to correct the numerous violations, but instead blatantly flouted the COVID guidelines as well as life safety regulations, uh, we would recommend that council impose the maximum penalty under the code and suspend the ability to sell alcoholic beverages at this establishment for 30 days. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Councilman Dinkfelder. So procedurally, I mean, you, Ms. Johnson was, you've been putting on evidence and that sort of thing. and. Um, is the representative from the? I, I believe that yes, their attorney is here. So, so procedurally, is he participating? Is this a hearing, cross-examination? It, it, it is a hearing. Certainly, he's uh, yes entitled to participate in the hearing. Yes. Okay. So, so, so is that I'm concluding. That's where we're going to start may, now. Yes. <coughs> is absolutely. He, is he right. Council Ms. Is, is, uh, Ms. Ms. Johnson. Yes, sir. Uh, there is pending uh, permits, special use permits. Any decisions we make tonight will have any bearings on those pending permits? This, uh, this proceeding is, in, is independent of the new special use permit, that application that is currently under consideration by the um, Development and Growth Management Department. And if, we, if, if this council decides to dis suspend their license and within three or four days they get another special use permit, that would be allowed. That that could that could very well that could very well happen. It would be up to council to determine, you know, the length and, and when that starts. But it would, I mean, this has to be considered separate and apart from the new special use permit application. Thank you, Mr. Council, Chairman. Councilman Good. So so what you're saying is, if this council imposes these sanctions tonight and they're going through a special use permit. They could be granted a permit with the 30 day sanctions we're giving them now, is that what you're saying? Council has the discretion. I mean, you could, you could direct, um, you could direct staff and you could craft any type of suspension period to address that situation. But I guess we should focus on this well, issue first. I, I get that, but I'm just, that's why I'm asking it because that, it, to me, that just doesn't make any sense. If I'm going to impose a sanction on somebody, but yet we're going to give them another permit for a special use, I mean, what? Again, that's, that's, that's to the. I see Mr. Shelby coming to the podium. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, then the attorney for, um, for the establishment, if you'd like to come up and speak. Mr. Uh, you, you can uh, show him the overhead. Okay. Mr. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. So uh, the attorney for the establishment, you'll be speaking solely for the establishment, the owner, and no one representative will be here, just only you, sir? Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, first of all, my name is Eric Koenig. Uh, I represent Maya Tampa in this matter. So that is the, uh, the business and license holder. Business and license holder, okay. Yes. So I'd like to go ahead and address some of the issues. So what I'd like to do is first talk about what, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Uh, look at some people leaning forward a little bit, uh, is number one, uh, why was there alcohol served on the rooftop when there was no permitting? Number two, to discuss the misconduct that, uh, that the council just heard about. Number three, what has been done to address the issues? And then lastly, moving forward, what the future plans are. So let's start first with what jumps out as arguably the most egregious issue, and that's why is Mole Abuela selling alcohol on a rooftop that it's not permitted to sell alcohol on the rooftop? And it's simple. 
Fly Bar never had the licensing to serve alcohol on the rooftop. Mole y Abuela merely purchased, Maya Tampa merely purchased what Fly Bar had. And what was conveyed, at least as part of the negotiations, was that there was licensing up there. And I'm not going to embarrass uh, anyone here in, in any department or otherwise of who has drank on the uh, Fly Bar rooftop or otherwise, but there have been people from the licensing, permitting, zoning, on down the road. So there was a, a just someone missed it. And it filtered the way down. And I've handed out a copy of the application. I'll show you here is page one, just to get an idea as to what the application looks like. And what I'll do is I'll draw your attention to you jump to page five, and it's the bottom <coughs> right. I marked it as Mole y Abuela 5 in fairly large font, just to make it easier to find. And as part of the application, you'll see that the applicant is asked to draw a picture or provide a diagram of all areas that are going to be covered by the, by the wet zoning. And what this is, this is the application to the state that was handed to uh, my clients as part of the sale. Look, this is, this is what we have, and this was the application that went to the state to show what zoning we had. And you can see on page five, it asks, draw all areas where uh, you are <coughs> requesting your alcohol basically the, the sign off from the state. And page seven is fairly clear that it shows the rooftop and even uses the word bar to describe it. So as part of the application packet that was proposed to the state, part of that application included wet zoning on the rooftop or at least believed to be on the rooftop. And if you turn to the next page, you'll see the sign off by Hillsborough County, or I'm sorry, the city of Tampa. So it was the local entity had to sign off on this application to show that the application was properly submitted. There was compliance with all zoning at that time and it includes an even a, a check mark saying that, this, that the wet zoning is above and beyond the confines of the building. And this being signed off, this didn't create some sort of right to sell alcohol on the rooftop. I'm not trying to argue that. And I would also like to clarify the, the testimony earlier by the, by the uh, officer that Mr. Pescante was on the phone with his attorney who said, by God, you can keep drinking alcohol on, on the rooftop. That wasn't me. So whatever advice received, I, I, I don't know if advice had been received that this document created a right to sell or drink alcohol on the rooftop. I'm merely showing it to you that this was why Fly Bar and Mole Abuela believed it could sell alcohol on the rooftop. So again, not trying to make excuses, but the idea is there had to be a reason why Fly bar and mole sold alcohol on the rooftop. Who owns the license? Excuse me, Mr. Chairman, if you recognize. I'm sorry? Can we recognize, sir? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Who, who owns the license? Uh, Maya Tampa. Maya Tampa. So we're subleasing the licenses to Fly Bar and Mule Bouillon. I probably can't pronounce the name right. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, no, it's my understanding that, that it was sold. So this sold. is now owned by Maya Tampa. Maya Tampa uh, purchased the alcohol license. And now it is in the shoes of what Flybar had before. It merely conveyed what Flybar had to Maya Tampa, or I'll say Mole, Iaboyla, operates as Flybar was permitted to. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Chair, to follow up on that question, what relationship does the new owner have to the old owner, personal or otherwise? I, I don't know there is any. I, I, but I also don't know. I, my, my firm didn't handle that, and that was something I wasn't involved with at all. So you know of no relationship one way or the other with the old owner? That's, that's correct. On, on your, on your doc, if I may continue, Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. On your document on the last page, it says, and where you have highlighted, it says right, ab right above that, 
conditioned to operate as a restaurant. Is there also dining on the uh, on the top floor? There is. It yeah. is, and it's used as a restaurant type of dining, and not just some sort of buffet to to um, have the appropriate amount of uh, food served for the alcohol. That that's correct. I I've, I've sat up there and 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 had dinner. I I. I at least from discussions with my client, that was standard. It was just a, another place where people could sit and as if they were in the restaurant. But at least I wanted to address the, the alcohol issue first, that I think that is an important issue. And then what did Mole Abuela do once it learned of it, or at least once I had any contact, which would have been right around the end of May, early June, was they stopped selling alcohol on the rooftop immediately. And then probably a week and a half later, they simply closed to try to figure out what to do with the COVID. And at least my discussions with the client without getting in any great detail, attorney client privilege, the client was confused as to the COVID guidelines and whether or not that was an enforceable law. Despite being told apparently repeatedly by law enforcement, that at least was the discussions I had early on and Mole Abuela decided to close to decide what to do, how to become COVID uh, compliant, and otherwise moving forward. It made, it made that decision early on before it needed to close, it chose to close. And at least as far as the that the council has heard, the lieutenant had no personal knowledge of any sort of wrongdoing. He merely looked over some reports and compiling. And, and I do understand this is quasi-judicial in nature. It's not the, the strict requirements of, uh, the, say, the rules of evidence. But again, this is something important enough that could involve the suspension or revocation of a license and the loss of some 77, 78 employees and a, and a business already having problems live testimony of personal knowledge which seemed to be important. And what the council did here was the crime protection officer, crime prevention officer, apologies, uh, testified that his first dealings with any sort of problems was on the 23rd of May and it extended until the 29th of May. And that it was some overcrowding, some loud music, but there were no arrests, there were no charges, there were no tickets. And then the next step was, what did Mole Boyla do to address the problems? And you heard Ms. Ms. Johnson Velez talk about. Mm -hmm. So I see a hand up. No, I was going to let you finish, but I did have a question for you. I'm, I'm not a fan of keep talking when someone someone needs to ask me a question. It's quasi judicial, not judicial. Um, and. <clears throat> Have you been given a copy of this notebook or, or? I have not. Okay, have you been provided with what's under tab 10 that Ms. Johnson Velez provided to us, which is, appears to be perhaps maybe 100 <laughs> pages of police reports? I have not. Um, Councilman Moran. Ms. Ms. Johnson Velez, oh, well, I've, I've is that been. something that that had had been made available to council? I mean, it, obviously, it's the basis. Right. This, it's well, the evidentiary it basis uploaded, for for, it, for what it, we're talking about. So, right. It was it was uploaded to. I mean, it's part of the record for yeah, right, right. this agenda item and for um, for this hearing. Right. So, council says he hasn't seen this. Was it? Did you offer it to them to to his firm at any time, or, or I'm just trying to figure out. It's right. an unusual yeah. process we're in, you know. Right, 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 exactly. So There's I did, probably no I mean, discovery or anything like that. Right, exactly. So it was it was uploaded similar to what what we do in quasi judicial in the quasi judicial um, realm. And, oh, so so it was part of it was part of our part of our city sire. Correct. If you program, it's on, uploaded into right. the clerk's system. Correct. And it was Mr. filed with. It was Mr. filed Mr. with. Mr. Martin Shelby here. I just wanted to let you know that I did confirm during this hearing that that packet was in fact uploaded. That the, the binder has been uh, uploaded to Sire, and um, I was going to suggest that um, council during this hearing 
make a motion to receive and file that to make that part of the record upon which you can base your decision. Now, I don't know whether this is not a court, obviously, and uh, I don't know whether council, have you, have you been in contact with the city to get the information, uh, the background material relative to this, uh, besides having public access to review it online? No, I've, I've had repeated contact, and in fact, from the very beginning of this, I was in contact with Ms. Wells, who would actually come from my office over to the city of Tampa, and we worked out a stipulation. The only thing left was the stipulation said there'd be no penalties. We would agree to follow all COVID protocols and everything given that Mr. Frank, Mr. Pascante and his business partner had been removed from Maya Tampa permanently, that they were substantial owners and operators and managers and at great expense have been kicked out of the organization in their entirety. And we came down to what to do with the rooftop, couldn't decide on it, and then Ms. Johnson-Velez stepped in, and I've been in repeated contact with her as well, but at no time were there any discussions that this would be, there'd be a binder, especially of some sort of a, a summary of police reports or the like that would go in evidence. Now, in fairness, I didn't ask her what evidence she intended to produce as part of this. It was, it was never addressed, one, one way or the other. Councilman Miranda. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councilor, I'd just like to ask a couple of questions regarding you and your client. How long have you been the, your attorney for that client? I have been the attorney for uh, Franklin Manor back when Franklin Manor was originally sued on the nu nuisance matter. And, and I recognize a handful of you that I, I had the, the interesting afternoon to, to go over some of those issues. And it was right around that time that it, there were some of the same owners, some of the same operators. So, I, so it, was, it was somewhere in that time I, I started handling some matters, but it wasn't until this, uh, this dealing, the end of May, early June, when I was contacted with, look, we went through the problems with Franklin Manor, can you help us with Mole Abuela? Then I, I would have to make an assumption that they called you when the police interviewed them? I don't know the time frame of, of when they contacted me, they, or at least I can tell you it was, it was the end of May, so certainly it was post-police contact. But you were aware that there was something going on with your client and TPD? Yes. And, and at that time, as time goes on, uh, they didn't ever tell you that the city was looking into revocation of a license for some period of time? They, they shared me, they shared with me the, the notice, or at least they shared with me some of the documentation, and then Ms. Wells from the city of Tampa pr presented uh, additional copies of the notices, and then I think Ms. Johnson Velez did as well. Did you ever call the police department to get a record of what happened? I, I, I did not. Thank you very much. Councilman Citro. Thank you very much. Did your employees ever tell you about how many times either TPD or fire rescue came in? Was it reported at, at uh, weekly, monthly uh, briefings? Hey, boss, we, got, we have a problem. It, it was my understanding that it was right that last week or so of May is when I think, I think I agree with the crime prevention officer that it was right around that last week or so was when there were pretty constant inspections and, and that's when things seemed to be really boiling over. And I believe I was sought for advice concerning well, what is the effect of this executive order? It's called COVID guidelines. What are the effects of these things? And at that point, there were discussions. And really, this was a business that was really being operated more so on weekends than it was during the week. So it wasn't quite the daily meeting type, type situation when I got involved. It was one that I think that some of the managers who have since been ousted uh, we're, we're discussing what to do next, where, what's going on in the next, you know, how to deal with, with whether they're violations, what they can do moving forward, what, what's permissible. So I, I, I don't know if I answered your question, but I don't think they were daily briefings, but I believe the managers at the time were talking often on what to do as this was fairly un unchartered territory. And so you're saying that the uh, management and, and ownership was aware that there was officers and fire rescue coming in? So certainly, I, I think I think by by that last week or so of May is when is when there were repeated contact with with law enforcement and the fire marshals, 
and then I was contacted, I guess, right near the end of that week or so, and then the following week, I believe, is when Mole shut down, stopped selling alcohol, and tried to go in internally to address the issues as well as primarily its management problems. One more question, Mr. Chair. Uh, was it ever brought to the uh, management or owner's uh, uh, attention that there were complaints coming from surrounding neighbors? Yes. Yes. And how long, how long had, had those complaints been going on that you're, that you're aware of? I'm aware that there were no problems with this location at all until uh, the beginning of May, that there were some issues with some noise, and then it really, it really boiled over by the, end of, by the end of May. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilman Dingfelder. You're, you're Mr. Koenig, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm looking at a, an email from you to, uh, to our chairman, but copied to um, Ms. Johnson Belez, Mr. Shelby, stated October 15th regarding the October 22nd hearing. And it says, please be advised that this firm represents MYA Tampa, LLC, DBA, Mole Abuela, with respect to the quasi-judicial hearing scheduled for October 22nd virtual. Given the seriousness of the accusations, coupled with the need to provide a variety of documents in defense of same, my client does not consent to the virtual hearing, et cetera. I find that interesting, and I think we need to kind of cut to the chase. You've heard testimony. You've heard Ms. Johnson Velez is making a case on behalf of the city. You've heard testimony from the officers and from the, the uh, fire department. I would say, even though it's quasi-judicial, it's a little more formal than most of what we do, but you probably have an opportunity to cross-examine if you believe, if you dispute what these officers have to say. I think that's a right that you could take advantage of. That's up to Mr. Chairman. Additionally, you point out that you have defenses and you have a variety of documents in, de in support of your defense. I haven't heard or seen either, and I'm trying to be as respectful as possible, but it's getting late in the evening, and I think we need to move this along. The only defense I've heard so far is the defense of ignorance in terms of your client. They purchased it from a, the prior owner, the fly. They didn't know what they were getting, that sort of thing. Okay, if, if that's the defense, we can evaluate that. Is there any other defense? And do you have documents in support? And do you want to cross-examine? So I'll, I'll try to work that back in, in reverse order. And, and, and thank you. Is As far as the cross-examinations, I, I agree. I, I think I have a right to cross-examine the witnesses. I had nothing to cross-examine them on. The first witness had no personal knowledge at all as far as the, the, the TPD officer of any wrongdoings. He really looked over what other people had done and never been to the space. The second officer discussed uh, some of his dealings in a short week whereby no charges were, were filed, no arrests were made, and no, no tickets were written. A cease and desist order was provided uh, to the organization, and, and that was it. So as far as cross-examinations are concerned, uh, anything I, I needed to cross-examine, I would have. Uh, in addition to that, as far as documentation was concerned, is we had the entire file for the wet zoning applications and that Originally, the, at least as far as strategy was going to be, is to go over every one of those documents and with Ms. Uh, Ms. Doc or whoever the representative would be for zoning and licensing for each and every one. So as far as whether we had more documents then or less documents now doesn't make a difference, is that the strategy as we have moved forward has been less of one to challenge any of the issues, but one rather one of looking at the factors that the council is to consider in rendering any sort of punishment, and that is the severity of the uh, violations, which we've talked about, those that there have been no uh, tickets written, even there are some other businesses that have been similar, uh, albeit may not have been as prevalent as others. Uh, what has Mole done since the violations? It shut down business at great expense and resources, it got rid of the problem. It got rid of the two individuals who had a substantial ownership stake and were the named managers of the restaurant that couldn't be easily revoked. It was all removed, they were removed, and there have been no problems, there's been no testimony 
uh, even conglomerations of reports, there's been a single problem since the end of May, nor will there be in the future, is that this company understands it's under the microscope at this point and moving forward. It's dealing with COVID problems the same as all the other restaurants. The employees can't go over to other restaurants and find can, other restaurants. Can I interrupt jobs. you once, one more second? Did you bring any of your clients here to testify as to that? It's all fine and good. You look, seem like a, a, a great young man and a bright attorney, and I know your firm well, but do you have anybody here to testify to give us those kind of assurances? Uh, no, Your Honor, because, sorry, <laughs> no councilman is no chair, is that, is that those types of, of platitudes and promises aren't going to get us anywhere. Rather, it is what has been done, what kind of uh, complaints have occurred since the end of May, and the answer is none. We've applied for the proper licensing and moving forward. Mr. Chairman. Councilman Goods. I guess for me, that's my problem. Yes, you're the attorney of record that is, that is here, but we're talking about if I'm a business and I'm an owner of a business, my business is at stake. And if my business is closed, I can't make any money. And employees can't make any money either. So for you to be here and not have the owners, because it's just, obviously there's an owner issue that no one was, was complying because there was bad ownership or split ownership, whatever, but no one who's gonna be in charge or the new owners or the, the split owners or the new owners are here to say, to make their case that we're gonna make sure that these things don't happen going forward, that we've had protocols and standards and SOPs in place now. I, I guess that's the problem I'm having. And as you recall, the first thing I asked when you came up, are, are you representing owners, are anybody else here to, to talk about, because since you made a statement going forward, so I can hear what you say, but you're just a paid person to talk for the owners. So that's what, what I look at because you're not gonna be there. The, it's the owner's business, and they're gonna be there hiring managers or whatever. So what assurance do I have that they're gonna hire people who are experienced or running bars or running a, a, a club or alcohol, or whatever? I just hear from you. So that's kind of the problem I really have at this point that I've got no assurances. I don't, I don't know what's gonna be happening down at that place down there. I just have you just trying to be in defense to try to talk for the owners, but yet it's their business, not yours. Well, what I, what I would respectfully request, if, if that is an important enough issue, and again, the ownership doesn't know what it's going to do with the business. Uh -huh. if, if, if we weren't in COVID, it, it might be different to say, well, here's our long-term plan. Right now, the ownership may sell. It, it may try to keep this thing limping along as best it can. It doesn't know. And quite honestly and candidly, that's the reason that there's not an owner representative here who would come in and say, I, I'm sorry, I don't know what we're going to do. With COVID, we, we may sell it next week. We, we don't know what we're going to do. But, but you're applying for permits, correct? We're applying for, we're, uh, we're trying to fix the problem of the, of the rooftop zoning. I'm sorry, the, the rooftop licensing. That's, that's the purpose of the new special use permit. It isn't to otherwise uh, get brand new licensing to carry. It's to fix, it's to fix the problem. And, and if, it is a, if it is a large enough issue that the council says, look, we really want to hear from ownership, even if he doesn't know what he's going to do with it, I'll respectfully request a continuance to the next available date, and I'll have someone here to say, look, here's my plan, here's what I'm doing, but at least back in that first hearing, we didn't know. And I don't want to go in and say, I, I don't know what I'm going to do, and I can't promise you something if I still don't know what the long-term plan of this, this property is with COVID. Yeah, they, they don't know even if it does everything perfectly, it's going to survive this irrespective of, of a suspension or other penalty. Well, that, that's the problem for me, uh, not having ownership to say anything but having their attorney. But yet attorneys come and go, and you can tell me one thing, but yet I still haven't heard from the business owners who actually own the license who are going to run the bar or run the, the restaurant, whatever they're running. So, uh, Councilman Moran. Thank you very much. From what I'm hearing, Councilor, is uh, – it's not this government or any government or any uh, entity that uh, regulates alcohol zonings uh, to some degree to be the one responsible to see that the employees understand 
all the laws regulating whatever license they have, either a complete license or what floor or what. That, that's not our burden. The burden is on the person who bought your client is the one who's got the burden, not us. We're trying to talk like we have the burden. No, no, no. The burden is on your client at the time that they purchase something, know what they purchase. It's up to the burden of your client to understand what kind of license they have, where to serve or not to serve, not mine. They're the ones that made the deal, not us. They're the ones either made the deal and made a good deal or a bad deal. Or they're the ones that made the deal not knowing what they made. So the burden of proof, I don't feel that we have to prove anything. You're the one that represent the proof that they have to apply to their employees on what to do and not to do with the liquor license, not us. I agree. Thank you. My, Mr. Chairman, if I can, Martin Shelby here. I yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Johnson Velez, you have something that she needs to communicate. Oh, I just, I just wanted to remind counsel, just with respect to the um, officers, um, Mr. Koenig suggested doesn't have personal knowledge. So I just want to remind counsel, I believe there were 19 surrounding neighbors who had signed up to speak to this item. Yes. Um, yes. And they might yes. provide some of that Other personal well, bef knowledge. Before we, we go to the registered speakers, my problem is this. We had a stay-at-home order from the governor, from the municipality. Businesses shut down for 30 days, whatever it was. Restaurants couldn't serve, bars couldn't serve, nightclubs weren't open. And then May comes along, and the state is reopening in phases, 25% capacity at restaurants, 50% capacity. I don't remember the schedule. But on social media, a video appears of, I think it was Mole Iowela, packed to the you know, packed as, as, as has been um, stated in, in uh, the recollections here by the, uh, by the individuals. The photographs that we saw, crowds outside, as if it was a regular Thursday night, you know, college party. Everyone else knew, not everyone else because other people were in violation, but people knew that there were rules. People knew that we were opening in phases. People knew that the governor's orders were going you know, little by little, yet this restaurant was in blatant violation knowing, you know, it's just, I think back to Franklin Manor when there were issues on noise and whatnot, and some of the attitudes of some of the people that are no longer affiliated with the company. Um, and it was, you know, I'm not gonna repeat because it was just foul language, bad language, bad attitudes, but um, I think it was it's easier to ask for forgiveness and ask for permission. That's one thing, but this was just, they felt like doing whatever they wanted to do. And those individuals, or one in particular who's not with the company, um, has created such a problem. Because Mole Abuela, I assume it's still boarded up. Last time I saw the, the place was boarded up, Franklin Manor was boarded up. There were protests outside, because I was down there to see how it was and what was going on. but. It's just a blatant lack of respect that has brought it to this problem. It's not about serving alcohol on the rooftop and not knowing. It's completely violating the rules in place. While other businesses were closed, while other businesses were serving at 25% capacity or takeout only, or not serving alcohol at all, because I was getting complaints. One, one gentleman even asked, can you reach out to the governor so he can lift the stay on alcoholic beverage, you know, bars not being able to serve, which I couldn't do. But um, that's it. I mean, if they would have followed the rules and not had these wild parties uh, in violation, we wouldn't be here today with these discussions. I mean, you're the attorney. I understand the clients are not here. The, some of the people are not, no longer involved. But this could have been avoided. So here we are. Having said that, we have, I believe, 12 registered speakers still on the line for public comment. Um, if, if I may only just respond to what you just said. Yes, if you want. Is, is, I agree. This was blatant irresponsibility. It was ignoring the rules. It was putting people in, in potential harm's way. But there were two people who ran everything, had a huge ownership stake, and all the, the remaining, the current owners and current managers could do is work out getting rid of these guys, and I do understand it sounds, hey, these are the bad guys, don't punish us, they're the ones who did it. But at the end of this, 
they are removed, the problem is addressed, and now any punishment levied is on the remaining people. And I understand that's a, a, a part of accountability, but I just want to remind, at great expense and great resources spent getting rid of these guys to resolve the problem permanently, any other punishment is on those who weren't making the decisions. They're those who are now trying to fix the problems and try to keep this afloat. Again, I understand accountability and, and you're going to do whatever you find is right and, and equitable, but as far as how to address the problem, how to address someone like this guy who wrote those emails about the city of Tampa and, and this council is, is unheard of. And running him out and running out his business partner is, is all at this point that the business could do and try to keep it afloat. And at the end of the day, it's a shame because it's a, it's a good business. I mean, they make money, you know, the nocturnal group or whoever they are or whatever it is. It's a shame to see them get to the point of having to board up because certain things were said, you know, months ago that triggered some, some protests in that, in that part of town, whatever. I mean, I, you know, you said everything that needs to be said. Mr. Councilman Chairman, Mr. Chairman, if we can, just before we take the comment and, and if legal or Ms. Ladock wishes to uh, add to this, what I'm about to say, uh, I, I would welcome that. But how many times has council been heard, how, how many times has council heard the, the, the statement, this special use runs with the land? And quite frankly, it's, there is a, a property that's associated with these conditions. And irrespective, it is the obligation of perhaps multiple parties, but ultimately that property has to comply with certain conditions in order to have that special use. And if it violates, if those special use conditions are violated, what suffers is the property's right to continue to have that special use. So I think what's important to look at is the fact that there is a special use and that there is a specific property which is tracked by land development that is attached to that right. So I suggest that you take a look at that rather than look at who is to blame for this because ultimately it runs with the land. And I'll leave it at that unless there's something else. Councilman Vieira. And thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And I, and I was actually going to say something to the effect of what our esteemed attorney, uh, Mr. Shelby, said. I kind of look at it too, not literally, but kind of like vicarious liability, which is, you know, you have an employee working for you, they commit a tort, and of course in scope you're liable for it as the employer. It's not 100% the same as they're, you're the, the partners. I, I, I get that. I think one of the things that frustrates people is that if um, the, these uh, leftover partners are saying, hey, look, we're the good guys or we're the good gals, whatever, right, that they're not here to express it. Obviously, you're their fine, capable attorney from a uh, great attorney from one of the best firms in Tampa. Um, but I think that's something that frustrates us. Obviously, it's their right to be represented by outstanding counsel. But just the fact that they're not here, I think, um, leaves something to be desired. I personally don't think it's grounds for a continuance. Um, that's that 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 was uh, their uh, uh, their choice, but I think that ultimately you um, you know get the benefit of the detriment of the business associations that you keep, and like our attorney said, it runs with the land, and and that's unfortunate. Is is it fair to them if they didn't know or didn't have reason to uh, to know at all that this was occurring? Very unfair, um, but you know it uh, that's just how it is, I guess. But I'll stop talking because it's getting late, and I'm going to say something dumb. Wait. Thank you, <laughs> Councilman uh, Dingfeld. Um, Ms. Johnson Velez, will you, um, will you, uh, I, I've been looking through this amazing <coughs> no notebook that you put together and a huge amount of work that you put into this, but um, will you tell us what the bottom line is in terms of uh, what our options are this evening after we hear all the testimony and the people who are waiting? What yeah. our options are in terms of uh, suspension or revocation? Certainly. Susan Johnson Boyce, <coughs> uh, Senior Assistant City Attorney. So because this would be a first violation for this property, council is limited to the, a maximum of 30-day suspension. When you get to a second um, situation like this, a second hearing like this, you can consider a 60-day suspension maximum. A third violation you can consider a 90-day suspension, and then on the fourth and subsequent, you can consider revocation. Okay, because I saw revocation as an option there, but you're saying it's 
step it by is step. A step. It is a step by step, yes. Okay. All right, I just wanted to put that in context to council. All right. Mr. Chair, Ms. Johnson Velez. Yes. Can sir. we also say that 30 day also includes the pending uh, uh, special permits that, that are being requested? 30 days on the, on, the, on the alcohol cells they have now, plus nothing more on those special use that are pending for 30 days. Well, I, I would suggest let's let, maybe let's get through this. Yes, but I'll hear all the I evidence get. first and then. Okay. So all maybe right. we've, we, we have, have 12. We have uh, 10 people registered online uh, to speak publicly. Mr. Shelby, do I have to swear everybody in? Yes, sir. All right. Well, we'll start with public comment. The online registered folks, if they want to come on, I have a list here. Uh, we'll swear you in before you speak. All right. <laughs> All right, Robert V shows a blue screen. I'm sorry, Robert E. Uh, Scott. My camera's on, I'm not sure why it's blue. Okay. Can Scott, you hear me? I can hear you, but we can't see you. It's just, it's just blue. Scott Tankle is uh, there. All right. Let's hear from Scott. We have uh, Randall. Uh, we have uh, Deborah Oxley. All right. So let's swear in Scott, Randall, and Deborah. Raise your right hand. They're going to swear you in. You swear or affirm you'll tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. All right. Uh, Scott, if you'd like to begin, you have three minutes. Please state your name, and uh, we'll go from there. You're muted, sir. Scott, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. OK, thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Scott Tankle. I am the board president of the Residences of Franklin Street which sits just south of Mola'i Abuela. The building consists of 42 units of one, two, and three bedroom units. Medical professionals live here, elderly people live here, and families live here. These are, some of the units are three bedroom. I'm here to give a voice to our residents who lost many hours of sleep and whose right of quiet enjoyment of their residences was violated by Mola'i Abuela. Uh, Mola y Abuela, before having closed its doors, engaged in reckless, illegal, and destructive behavior. The restaurant, from the management and the owners down, encouraged and promoted a culture reminiscent of a nightclub, as we've heard. Management and staff, they thumbed their noses at the city's police, the fire marshal, the restrictions intended to stop the spread of COVID-19 in our city, which we're still fighting. How many cases of COVID spread at their parties? Night after night, for weeks, our residents were forced to call police begging for assistance. The issues we routine, routinely faced include, included thumping bass from the rooftop, which included DJ, screaming from the rooftop, shattering bottles, fights, uh, vehicles revving their engines and peeling out outside of the restaurant, many, many incidents of documented public urination because the bar and nightclub that they were running did not have adequate restrooms for their patrons. Our story began on May 5th when Mole was permitted to reopen and through a massive Cinco de Mayo party that was picked up by local news. From that point, every Tuesday, Taco Tuesday, Wine Down Wednesday, Thirsty Thursday, Friday Celebration, Saturday, All You Can Drink Brunch Sunday, six days of the week we suffered from them. It was mayhem after mayhem. And mind you, this was supposed to be a restaurant. Our calls to the police were often in vain because the police either had to deal with irate owners from our building who couldn't sleep or management from Mole who were disregarding them. Uh, they were largely ineffective and the second the police would leave, the music would turn right back up and we would seem like fools calling again. The police just did not want to deal with us. No, no disrespect to them, but I, I understand where they're coming from. There is no reason to believe that any additional restrictions imposed on Mole will be followed. We've witnessed their behavior with Franklin Manor, um, and we've witnessed their behavior flaunting and disregarding the COVID violations. 
They are unrepentant. They, they sent their attorney. They couldn't even show up to speak on their own behalf. Here we are, our residents sat on in the hall and on our computers for six hours to speak our minds, yet the owner who is pretending that this business means so much to him couldn't be bothered to show up. Uh, we heard tonight from the police that they were the most egregious of violators and they have no respect for our neighborhood. They were confused by the law. Ignorance of the law is not an excuse. It's not satisfactory. We have personal knowledge. Molloy's attorney said that the officers do not have personal knowledge. The city attorney does not have personal knowledge. We suffered every single night for over a month, not to mention the nights prior to that, prior to COVID, that they also disregarded any social bounds or social norms. Uh, again, contrary to Molloy's attorney's suggestion, Molloy did not shut down to figure out how to deal with COVID. They shut down June 2nd because their employee had a racial meltdown online. That's why they shut down, not because they needed to figure out how to operate in COVID. Let thank, that be known. Thank you very the owners much. owners could not be bothered. I have nothing more to say. I thank hope you. you take our case seriously. Thank you very uh, much. Board President, I would just say one more thing. We are not asking for a suspension. We are asking for a revocation of their alcohol license. Thank you very much. Randall? Hi, my name is Randall Matolka. I am uh, in Unit 504, which is directly overlooking the rooftop bar of Mole y Abuela. I had uh, a perfect view to see them still pouring drinks behind the bar, even after the cops came to shut them down and said no more drinks up there. Um, it all started, like uh, Mr. Tinkle said, on May 5th, Cinco de Mayo. It was standing room only on the rooftop bar. Um, on I, I couldn't sleep because of the music, even through our stormproof windows, which would be up until 3 a.m. I'd be going outside because I'd be hearing the fights, the music, everything that was going on. I'd have uh, many videos that were provided were possibly from me. Um, people standing out in the streets, still with their drink in their hand, waiting for their Ubers, drunk and not being able to stand up. Uh, public urination right on the building when there's a fight right next door in the uh, parking lot. Um, 10 times in the month of May, I called the police and I actually had to leave for a full week because I couldn't sleep. I am a physician who lives here and I work with car accidents. So I was an essential worker this entire time. And the worst nights were Tuesdays and Thursdays. And that's the middle of the work week. And that's the middle of the time I was trying to help people and I was a zombie trying to help anyone. Um, I would also like to point out that I did see them do the, uh, on May 28th, how uh, officers mentioned that they provided the uh, stop to sell liquor at the rooftop bar. They took the bottles off of the top of the bar, but they were still underneath. So they were pulling them out and pouring drinks for them. And I could see it directly straight from my balcony as the cops were still on the rooftop. And then when they left, they still had 11 security officers on the rooftop bar which I don't see the point of having 11 security officer or security personnel for a restaurant. Um, and then on May 30th, I have a video that it actually showed bottle service girls carrying a bottle of champagne up to the rooftop bar with lights and dancing and trying to have fun with the crowd, um, which is two days after that was uh, given. And I would also uh, just like to say that I agree that they did not choose to close they boarded up, and that's why they have not had any issues since that day. Thank you very much. Deborah? Yes. My, my name is Deborah Oxford. Hold on one second. Okay. Um, and I live in the as well. Uh, After a lot of days and weeks of putting up with these calls and things, or I'm sorry, putting up with all this noise outside, we like to leave our windows open as we have right now. We can hear the whistle in the background. Um, it got to be ridiculous. We should these girls screaming outside at three in the morning, 
can check to see if there's any problems, whatever the case may be. Overall, I just agree with, with what has been said by Scott and by Randall. Um, we have lots of videos. They did board it up just because of the verbiage that was put out there. So um, anyways, that's all I have to say for this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. DeMauro and uh, Mr. Yee, if you could raise your right hand so we can swear you in before you speak. Do you swear or affirm you'll tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I will. Yes. Thank All right. you. I will. Robert Yee, go ahead, sir. Yes, good evening, counsel. And, and you've already heard a lot of egregious uh, items about Molly Awela. I originally made a, uh, an online complaint to Councilman Goods on May 18th via Tampa.gov. My issue was loud music, unruly patients on the sidewalk, and on our porches. I live in the building uh, just to the north of Mole Awale. On February 19th, when Mole opened, we were, we were glad because it seemed like it was going to be an upscale wet restaurant with uh, Spanish, Mediterranean, Mexican food. Uh, but in October 2019, they started, I guess they called it Taco Tuesday and Latin Night Tuesday. That brought loud music, drink specials, which also brought in the night, nightclub party growers rather than the restaurant crowd. Music would resonate throughout the neighborhood. Complaints about the loud music by my neighbors that live on the end unit of my building next door to the restaurant were unresolved by the restaurant. They would promise to turn it down, but it never lasted very long. In May of 2020, Molly Awale made the transformation from being a restaurant with occasional music to a full-blown, raucous nightclub with loud music, crowds of people that seriously degraded the quality of life of the surrounding neighborhood. Loud music blasted from the rooftop from around 10 p.m. until they closed at 3 a.m. The building was packed on both the first floor and on the rooftop, so the overflow crowd of noisy people lined up outside waiting to get in while they congregated in bunches outside on the sidewalk and some would sit on our porches and also come around the back of our building to urinate. Cars with booming music would troll up and down Franklin Street. Fights would break out almost nightly in the parking lots across the street from the restaurant. My wife and I, we didn't feel safe to walk outside of our building after 9 p.m. because of the noisy crowds on the sidewalk and they were even in our driveway. Nightly complaints were made to TPD about the loud music which would be turned down somewhat, only to be returned to blasting levels five or 10 minutes after the police officers left. Verbal complaints to the owners of management on site were met with, we want to be good neighbors, but we're running a business. I took this to mean that they expected us to live with what we saw as a degradation of our neighborhood quality and quality of life in favor of their business. Finally, as you already know, Molia Whale is surrounded by three multi-unit residence buildings which are Franklin Street City Lofts, my building, the residence on Franklin Street, which has 40 units in it, and the historical Arlington Hotel across the street. We are over 100 taxpaying residents that would like some level of peace and quiet in our neighborhood during the evening and night hours. We are unable to get this with a noisy nightclub next door. And I, like uh, Scott earlier said, I have no confidence that they will not do the same thing if, if you allow them to continue to operate. They were not operating as a night, excuse me, as a restaurant. They were operating as a raucous nightclub, which brought along the usual crowds of noisy people that staggered out and fought in, park, fought in parking, lights, parking lots nightly. We were, we were awakened three and four o'clock in the morning until the crowds dissipated. I don't know what else I could add other than uh, to see my three minutes of it. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Mr. DeMauro. <coughs> You're muted, sir. You have to unmute yourself. <clears throat> okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you. My name is James DeMauro. I live at 1108 uh, North Franklin Street, apartment 406. <coughs> And I'm here to tell you that I have never, never been so frightened about a situation as developed 
every evening that the mole and abuela was allowed to be open after 11 p.m. It operated fully and totally as a bar. It was incredible, the number of cars in the parking lots. It was a traffic jam every night. Hundreds of people waiting outside to get in. Not, nobody observing COVID. And I, uh, fr I'm frankly appalled at the number of times that we, as a neighborhood association, as individual peoples, called the police department and they came, they did come, and they did see what we saw. But how come nobody filed any complaints? I don't understand why. I, I, I can't believe that I'm living in a city that allows, does anybody on the, on, the, on the council remember Kitty Genovese, 1964 Manhattan? She got stabbed to death outside of buildings where nobody paid any attention to her screams. That's the kind of noises that was going on in a residential neighborhood at one, two, and three o'clock in the morning, two to three nights a week. It was just horrible. I've never seen anything like it before in my life, and I'm 72 years old, and I hope I don't ever see this again. If, God forbid, we're allowed to have this restaurant open again, I would like it to be a restaurant that closes at 11 and everybody goes home. We have broken bottles in the street we had people urinating everywhere. There were people of questionable purposes walking up and down the streets. It was just incredible. It was everything that everyone has said before. I have some videos of it. It's just something that nobody should have to live through. I thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you very much. I see uh, five people on the screen that want to speak, please uh, raise your right hand. We're going to swear you in before you speak. You swear or affirm you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank All you. right, first one is Travis. You have three minutes. Go ahead, sir. You're muted. Unmute yourself. My name is Travis Moore. I'm a property owner adjacent to Mole on the North. And I just want to say I completely attest to the accuracy of everyone speaking before me. Um, I too am a doctor. I work in the morning. And the biggest thing that got to us was the loud music and the violence and everything that came with it. Um, the sense of safety, music, cars blaring. So it's, I guess, in my opinion, it's not so much the liquor laws that is the issue. I think it's more these people can't be trusted. They should really have restaurant capabilities. They're really destroying our property values and our livelihood in the city. And I think it's something that really needs to be addressed, if at all possible. Um, that's all I want to say. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Next up is Sergio. He's in Chatsville. Hello, Council. Thank you. Um, I live in the building just east of Mole Abuela at 1229 North Franklin Street. And I agree with what everything everyone said. And if possible, I wanted to, could, would I be able to yield my time to Fernando Perez? No. Uh, I don't think we're doing that. We're, we, don't, we don't do that on virtual. Okay, then uh, I'll be short, but just one thing. Um, I did want to uh, reiterate the point that they closed because there was a huge backlash on social media um, uh, based on racial comments that were made by one of the promoters, managers, operators. Uh, they didn't close because they were trying to get their act together COVID. Uh, very well documented. Uh, I personally saw it. I know a bunch of people that personally saw it, why they closed and had the board help. So that is what happened. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Fernando Perez. Thank you. Uh, my name is Fernando Perez. I live at 1212 North Franklin. I'm part of Franklin City Lofts and my property, my specific residence, uh, is the closest one to Mole. We are 50 feet away. My front door is 50 feet away from their front door. Uh, I echo everything everyone has said. Uh, in addition to that, uh, because we're right there, uh, the front of my property is sort of where everybody goes from Mole when they need to, uh, you know, smoke a joint or engage in some public uh, sex or, uh, you know, everything else that everybody's mentioned. 
uh, there is a feeling of unease and it's you don't want to look at just COVID violations and things like that. What you need to focus on is the disruption to the neighborhood uh, that these people created. They were basically destroying what is really a, a beautiful and very unique neighborhood in downtown Tampa. We've been living there for almost 14 years uh, and you know, Fly was there for a while, never had a problem with them. The problem started with, the, with these people and it didn't start in May. We had noise problems with them pretty much from a couple of months after they opened. Initially, they were receptive. Uh, they would turn the music down, but eventually they would stop uh, responding. I had the text numbers, I mean, the mobile numbers for every one of the managers, and after a while, they just ignored us. And that's when I started calling the police in December. Uh, then they were closed for a while, and then you heard what was going on in, uh, in May. Total disregard for the community. I wanted to clarify a couple of things that Mr. Koenig had said. Uh, don't believe for a second that these are different owners. The people that currently own the property are more involved with the people that are supposedly out, which I don't believe is happening either. These are the, this is the same crowd that was involved with Franklin Manor and all the problems there. Uh, and to give you another example, the, uh, the head manager at Mole uh, is now the, the front person at the restaurant is going to replace Trattoria. No, nobody has changed. All they've done is a they, they, little shell game with the corporations, move some names around, but the same people are still involved in this. And the current owners, everything that was done at Franklin Manor, everything that was done at Mole was done with their complete knowledge and acceptance. Uh, so don't, don't believe that things have changed. And that's why we don't believe that if they're allowed to continue to operate, that anything's going to change. This is a group that looks at every opportunity to push the envelope and see what laws they can violate. That's their nature and that's what they're gonna keep doing. So if they're allowed to continue to operate, it's just a matter of time before we're here, before you again. Unfortunately, I thought you could revoke their their, uh, their beverage license completely. I understand from uh, the city attorney that's not possible. That's a shame because that's what should be. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Robert. Oh, good evening. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Council. My name is Robert Isles. I live at 1214 North Franklin. I live actually in between uh, 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 Fernando and Travis Moore. Um, and I would have to say, and I'd like to address a few very factual things. With all due respect, uh, the petitioning entity has not demonstrated anything that would show they deserve a reinstatement of any sort, uh, even just 30 days. And there are a host of reasons. Um, there were no complaints, as we have stated, after the end of May, uh, because Mole closed due to Mr. Pascante's social media habits. And uh, for that, we as the residents paid with days and days of protest that went up and down Franklin Street in front of our house. And to your point, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think you witnessed some of that firsthand. Um, the issues that have been cited by Susan Johnson Velez were never issues in the 10 years of Fly Bar's existence, and we have lived in this building for almost 11 years. Uh, the events cited were not random either. They were nightly, as the dated evidence files that you guys have been given show. If you look at the police request, the, uh, the, the call records, the photos, the video, all of that has been submitted to you all for review in that binder, and it was every day of the week. And, you know, in fact, Mr. Koenig's contention about they only operated on weekends is incorrect because your own fire marshal tonight cited his visit on May 27th, which was a Wednesday. And I would invite, as probably the penultimate example, reference the videos that were submitted that show one night, May 31st, in which you will see in the course of five hours, public intoxication, disorderly conduct, noise ordinance violations, violence, a hit and run in the parking lot across the street, public urination where the guy walked out across the street in front of Mole staff, dropped his pants and peed on a tree in full view of that. So to say that this was sort of limited is sort of ludicrous. Um, Mole's actions got to a point where they required nearly <coughs> constant contact from all of us with TPD and others to the point where we felt like we were taking them away from other things they should be doing. And in fact, we as the residents were submitting daily incident reports every day for what had happened the night before. And, and I'm not the only person here, but you know, I had calls and communication on at least six of the dates that Ms. Johnson Velez referenced this evening. And I think with regard to Mole's reaction, they were completely non-responsive to resident requests and input. Uh, they even had a meeting with the three HOA presidents of our buildings, to, at which nothing actually happened. And instead, uh, Mr. Spasconte and Anderson and their crew decided to be 
antagonistic and to use Mr. Koenig's own language to challenge and taunt the residents, which is really unacceptable. And you know, the result for all of us was an ongoing disruption of our neighborhood quality of life. Uh, we experienced property damage, public trash, vermin, uh, you know, the overall adverse impact on our properties and even an unwillingness of some prospective tenants to rent office space in the commercial space across the street. And Mole and Mr. Koenig have claimed to have eliminated the bad apples, but a quick look at Two Goons 2.0 uh, LLC, uh, which is listed as being solely occupied by Mr. Spascante and Anderson, is actually currently listed as a 35% owner in MYA Tampa's corporate structure. So, uh, you know, I might point out that uh, even the petitioner's business partners, the guys in Two Goons, look at how they've chosen to name their LLC, if that doesn't give you an example of their approach to doing business. So I, I think in closing, Mr. Dahmer has repeatedly asserted that the residents do not want anything operating on his property, and nothing could be further from the truth. What we want is a business that operates within defined guidelines and doesn't adversely affect the neighborhood. And that's exactly what Flybar was. And so therefore, you know, I'm in complete opposition to the petitioner being granted the permits they're requesting. And in fact, I think it would do good for the council to take a look at Hyde Park Village as an example of how restaurants and bars can coexist with mid-density residential property. Those are businesses and, and you know, the, the restaurant called Meat Market is probably the closest thing you might find to what Mole was. That business closes at 12 a.m. completely and actually does quite well financially without disrupting the quality of life for the residents. Thank you very much. So I much. think that is the second thing to look at and I appreciate the time to address you all this evening. Thank you very much. Jennifer Jones. Good evening, my name is Jennifer Jones. I live at 1229 North Franklin Street and I'm speaking on behalf of the Homeowners Association of the Arlington, which is my building where I live and I'm a property owner. Um, I would echo the things that you've already heard. I'm not going to repeat those. They're all true. It was, an, it was a terrible situation for those of us that live in these buildings, it, especially beginning at the beginning of May and all the way through May. Mole's operation in May made life miserable for the residents. And when I say miserable, I'm gonna give you some specific examples that I personally witnessed myself. On Tuesday, at Tuesday, May 12th, at about 12.30 in the morning, I sat straight up in bed, was woken from a dead sleep because of an air horn that the DJ was playing on the roof. And then he came on his speaker and started talking. Those are the types of things that were happening. Um, on Saturday, May 16th, I had people on the back side of our building, two different units that were on the back side, far away from Mole, that were woken up in the middle of the night by the noise. That's how loud it was. We had five different residents that complained in that week because of the noise, because of the trash, because of the crowds. On Thursday, the 21st of May, there were screeching tires. There was a loud crowd that was all happening at midnight that woke me up personally. On Saturday, May 23rd, around 2.30 in the morning, the buildings had set up different coned areas to try to keep these unruly crowds out ourselves from driveways and places they shouldn't be. I personally witnessed people from Mole, their crowd, moving those cones out of the way so that they could then take advantage of parking lots they weren't supposed to be in, sit outside their cars, party outside their cars with what appeared to be alcoholic beverages, not inside that restaurant at all loudly screaming, playing music, doing the whole thing. On Tuesday, again, another Tuesday, the 26th, I was woken up myself and I was so angry that night, I marched over there and demanded to speak to the owners. I was mad as a hornet and I mean mad. This, by this time, what you have to understand is that we didn't know what night it was gonna happen. We didn't know how bad it was gonna be and the anxiety levels that we had just trying to anticipate what was going to happen were unbearable. A lot of us are professionals. We have actual jobs that we have to do at, you know, nine to five hours, and this was just unacceptable. On Friday, May 29th, I was woken up twice during the night, and there was a loud commotion. A lot of us went outside. We heard a fight occurring over in the 717 parking lot, and my understanding is you have a video of that fight and part of your materials. So that's what we actually witnessed. From my patio, I have a vantage point of inside that building. And I watched when they moved all of the tables out. It was a standing room only nightclub. They were packed in there like sardines, clearly in excess of the number of people that they were permitted, especially at a 50% capacity. So I have personally witnessed that and I am testifying as to those facts. And that brings me to another uh, statement about Mr. Koenig 
saying that he's the bad apples are separated he provided no evidence of that all he had to do was bring his owner i suppose to testify that the the people that allegedly caused all these problems are no longer involved we don't have any evidence whatsoever that that's actually happening all we have is a statement by the attorney that's oh yeah they're no longer involved as far as we can tell that's not the case we just don't have any evidence of it at all thank you very um, much thank you thank you all right is there anyone else online to speak no no one else is online to speak that concludes the registered speakers thank you is there anybody in the audience that's here to speak on mole yoela come on up sleep freeze <laughs> Boy, it's late. My name is Michael Landry. I live at 1108 North Franklin <coughs> Street, which is right next to the Mole. And I respectfully urge the council to revoke. I know that's not possible, but I'm to revoke Mole's license, uh, their alcohol permit. As we've heard tonight, employees have told TPD officers they would comply numerous times yet still repeatedly violated various ordinances. They clearly had no intention of following the law. This ongoing behavior just shows a lack of respect for the law, and they've demonstrated over and over that they are not responsible enough to operate a business of this type within the law. And aside from echoing everything that everybody else has said, that's all I've got. So thank, I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next speaker, and please use the uh, opposite lectern. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Victor Giordano. I live at 1108 North Franklin Street, right across the street from Mole Abuela. I'd like to make this short and sweet. Uh, I wouldn't have sat here for seven hours and listened to everybody else's problems and complaints if this wasn't a big deal. It is a big deal. Um, I've, my wife and I have lived on uh, 1108 North Franklin for five years. When we first moved there, the fly bar was awesome. It was like the cheers of the block. And then as soon as Mole took over, everything, as you heard tonight, kind of changed. So uh, I'm in uh, opposition to even give them a suspension. I would like a revocation of their license. With having a liquor license comes a responsibility that you all acknowledged this evening, and they are not responsible uh, in using liquor in their building. They really did not police anything at all. So um, the other thing I'd like to say to Mr. Koning is it took me today two phone calls to find out <coughs> of the footprint for the alcohol zoning. Just two phone calls to the city that I got the answer that the footprint on the roof was not zoned and that the outside sidewalk area was also not zoned. It took me, seriously, 20 minutes to find out that information. So I just want to bring that to all your attention, that it wasn't very, very hard to find out that information. And I just would like to say thank you very much for taking this consideration. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening. My name is Carla Saavedra, and my husband Henry and I live at the residence of Franklin Street at 1108 North Franklin Street. We own our condominium. Our condominium building is located on the southwest corner of Franklin Street and Royal Street. Mole and Abella is immediately across Royal Street on the northwest corner of Franklin Street and Royal Street. Our condominium is on the fourth floor and we overlook the Mole in Abuela rooftop bar. I urge you to revoke the special use permit that Mole in Abuela holds for several reasons. A special use permit is indeed special and it is permission to operate. In this case, a restaurant serving alcoholic beverages it is not permission to operate a nightclub disturbing neighbors. Primarily, a special use permit is a privilege, not a right. When this privilege is abused, it should be revoked by the city council. You grant the privilege, so you should revoke the privilege in this case. 
This is a very simple issue and a very simple solution. You have received extensive, competent, substantial evidence proving that Mola and Abella was abusing its privilege after repeated warnings to comply with the law, particularly in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. It is especially distressing to me and my husband that this privilege was abused during the pandemic when the risk to public health, safety, and welfare were particularly high. Our police forces were stretched to the limit and the operators of Mole and Abrella knew better than to encourage the abuse of their privilege. Mole and Abrella chose not to comply with the rules and actually was operating as a nightclub. Therefore, Mole and Abrella should no longer be entitled to enjoy the privilege of serving alcoholic beverages and therefore with city council as the representative of the people and the grantor of this privilege should be revoked the special use permit thank you and i would like to um give this statement and a copy of a letter that my neighbor amanda smith emailed to you all and to the record if mr. i may mr crew would you take it yes yes ma'am Thank you very much. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Okay. That concludes our public comment. Councilman Dingfelder. Uh, Carla and, and your neighbors, um, I know you've been sitting here all, all night and we appreciate your patience. Um, I asked a very pointed question to our legal counsel, and I'm sure you, res you, you <laughs> respect uh, their opinions that we are limited legally in, in our ordinance to a maximum of 30 day suspension. So no matter how we feel about the evidence and everything else, we're constrained by that. Anything else, anything more than that would be illegal. So I just, I just hope you understand that. May I, may I comment? I, I, I appreciate you saying that. I just wanted to make the point of how serious we all feel about this. I understand. So I, I thank you for your comment. Thank you. thank you very much. Councilman Vieira. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I, I just want to say, you know, I've served on city council for four years, and uh, this is probably uh, the, the group in public comment on a, on a land use zoning, whatever uh, issue that, that, that I've, um, how can I say it, uh, that has most affected me. Just people um, d during a pandemic, uh, you know, just being so affected and, and staying up to this to this hour. Many of y'all coming here live, um, but especially, I'll be frank. The the two individuals who were doctors, I, it, it uh, you know, I think everybody thought the same thing, which is, you know, here we have uh, what what appears to be a bad actor, what appears to be a bad actor, um, exacerbating or worsening um, uh, uh, things during a pandemic, and you have doctors being affected, frontline medical workers, then you have cops and firefighters. Um, I, I think each department, I may be wrong, has had 70, 80 uh, people out during, because of COVID, um, you know, having to be on the front line of that just, you know, uh, um, it, it affected me a lot with regards to what we can do. Um, I'm certainly on board to doing everything we can do. To quote uh, my, my, our friend, uh, Councilman Goods, don't tell me what you can't do, tell me what you can do. And there are things that we can do. So hope you don't mind me borrowing that, hey, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Anybody else? All right. Uh, Ms. Johnson Velez, is it now just uh, the decision on council or yeah. council's decision on what to do? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, can, I, can I get a motion to close public comment? So moved. Second. Right. I just want to ask one question, yes, Ms. Sir. Velez. Can you just for the record tell us what type of liquor license they have? They have a bar lounge um, license. The Do way it was, um, the way the, the fly bar, when, when the owner of the fly bar came in, it was licensed as a bar lounge, but the condition was placed on the permit that required them to be able to sell and serve food at all times that they were open. So is that That's a 5149 so or straight alcohol? Pardon me? Is that a 5149? It is not. That, okay. that would be a restaurant license. Yeah, this I, is I not wanted a to make sure. License. I wanted to make sure. Thank Correct. you very much. You're welcome. All right. Uh, and I didn't ask the, uh, the attorney, uh, did you have any rebuttal or anything at this point? 
Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Councilman. Mr. Liz, uh, whatever decision this uh, body makes, could a written report be sent to alcohol uh, and, and beverages in reference to uh, discipline in reference to uh, the petition? We, we can certainly we can certainly do that. We'll work with staff to do that. Uh, secondly, I know that uh, it's two separate things. If we impose whatever sanctions today, uh, but, but my concern is tomorrow with the special use is going forward. Um, it may be a time that council may need to come back and review our, our ordinance in reference to if someone is going to have some discipline imposed on a 30 discipline that they're applying that they not be uh, granted anything until uh, it's done. Uh, I think uh, to me, we're like a, it's a double-edged sword again. Uh, I'm gonna give you 30 days, but yet no, a, a week, we, uh, you're, while you're still applying for a special use permit. I, I don't understand that, that makes no sense to me. I'm allowing you to apply, but you, right now you're being disciplined or you're under sanctions right now possibly, but we're gonna let you apply. I think that's something this council we need to look at in the future and legal and, and come back with us with something because I think that needs to change. Certainly we can do that too as well. If I, if I may, if I could just suggest, um, so as you might recall at the beginning, I, I kind of read to you from the land development code section about what, what you needed to do in the, for this hearing. So if I, if, as you consider this, you consider, um, so the first thing that council needs to consider is whether based on the evidence and testimony that you've heard and received tonight, you believe there's been a violation um, of any one of that laundry list of, of items that I read to you. And I believe that we have presented evidence and testimony um, from both the um, city staff as well as the residents that shows that operation of the establishment has been in a manner that repeatedly or on an ongoing basis has negative secondary effects on surrounding property. You heard the um, significant testimony of the surrounding property owners. Um, I believe we've also established that the establishment failed to comply with provisions of the fire prevention ordinance as testified to uh, by investigator um, Rossetti and then um, failing to comply with the provisions of health, health and sanitation ordinances, those being specifically the COVID um, executive orders with the COVID guidelines um, that, as I stated earlier, under state law, because it, they were um, issued under a state of emergency, had the force and effect of law. So the first step would be to determine whether there are violations, um, and then the second step would be to determine what penalty you would like to impose um, within the confines of the code. Well, uh, I've been looking for that sheet there. I can't find it in my material here. I've been going through all these. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, if I may just say one more thing. Um, and, mm -hmm. I, and I understand your concern. So what I would also suggest, um, because of the situation that we have here with a, a pending special use application, so what I would suggest, even though they're independent, um, if you decide to impose a sanction or suspend alcoholic beverage sales, that you do so with respect to the property to this location, 1202 North Franklin, and that way, whether it's the existing special use permit or new alcoholic sales would be suspended for whatever time you would determine would be appropriate and, and not tied to any specific special use permit. But the penalty can only be up to 30 days, correct? This, be, for a first violation, that's correct. Right. Councilman Dinks, Mr. Chairman, if you want to entertain a motion, I'll be glad to make it. Mr. Go Chairman, the, the public hearing has not been closed. Can we'll I close. A, close the public Second. hearing. Second. Motion to close from uh, Good. Second, Councilman Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Public hearing is now closed. Go ahead, Councilman Dinkfeld. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ms. Johnson Velez, for all your work on this. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to uh, to suspend the sale of alcohol of beverages pursuant to Section 27-318, City of Tampa Land Development Code, for the property located at 1202 North Franklin Street, um, and specifically make make findings that, based upon the evidence that we've heard from Tampa Police Department. Uh, Tampa Fire Rescue, as well as the citizens uh, living adjacent to the property, 
and observing firsthand the activities within the establishment known as Mole Ibuela, um, generally from May, approximately the entire month of May really uh, appears uh, according to the testimony um, that we heard May 5th through the end of May, May 29th, at which point it appears that the restaurant or the establishment uh, closed down voluntarily. Um, but anyway, based upon the evidence that we heard, I do believe that it's clear, clearly been established and, and really, uh, with all due respect, uncontroverted by the uh, establishment's attorney that uh, that they violated um, not only the city code uh, in various sections, including uh, 27.130, and I'll get into that in a second, but also the, uh, the mayor's uh, executive orders as well as the governor's executive orders uh, during the uh, public health emergency. And specifically, Specifically, I'll, um, my motion will include uh, violations of, uh, of Section 27318, uh, Paren B, which is that they have been maintaining a nuisance on the property, Paren C, which is they've been engaging or permitting disorderly conduct on the property, Paren D, that they've been operating establishment in a manner that repeatedly and on, and on an ongoing basis has negative secondary effects on the surrounding property. Paren E, uh, that they've failed, failed to comply with the uh, provisions of fire prevention ordinance, uh, and I think that was as related to the uh, fire escape issue. Paren F, they failed to comply with certain health and sanitation ordinances of the city, county, and state, and then paren N as in Nancy, um, that they violated uh, uh, other conditions of Chapter 27 um, that were imposed by City Council pursuant to our um, Alcoholic Beverage Code. Um, and specifically, I would note that the evidence is clear. Um, especially from the TPD and TFR testimony, that when they were warned, they repeatedly, day after day and week after week for the entire month, ignored those warnings. And that's as related to noise, as related to uh, the size of their crowds, as related to uh, drinking on the rooftop, and, um, and the other violations that have been uh, alleged. Do we have so, a sec second. With that, I will make the motion and I don't know if there's anything else that Mr. Shelby might suggest. I will ask that uh, Mr. Chairman that that is for the property. Would it be correct Mr. Mr. Velez? That the sanction be imposed on the property. On the property on without the property. regard to you, any particular you special use. Take uh, amendment Mr. Dean Feller, that the sanction be imposed to the property. Correct. Well, though, to North Franklin. Mr. Shelby? Uh, and also, perhaps, an effective date when the 30 days should begin? Um, I would say effective uh, today. Um, for, for what are we allowed? One month or 30 days? 30 mm -hmm. days yeah. starting today. Today? The and, and, and also to oh, okay. put the today. property owner on notice. And thank you, Mr. Goods. Uh, for your second, to put the property on notice that it is the city's opinion that there is no, when they, if and when they do reopen 30 days from now, that there is no, hold on, let me see what it says here, that there's no opportunity for, for drinking, here it is, use of the rooftop for the sale and consumption of alcoholic beverages is not allowed and must cease immediately. So, so I want to include in this motion that we are putting the property owner 
on notice that even when they might reopen 30 days from now, that the city, uh, it's the city's position that they do not have permission, they do not have a license for the sale or consumption of alcoholic beverages on the rooftop. We have um, a motion from Councilman Dingfelder. May, may, I, may I ask for clearance? I, I think we ought to give a certain date. Uh, that's what we do at the racetrack. From this date, you got to say the date with today, date the 12th to January, whatever it is, the 11th or whatever yeah. it comes in. But you got to give the date, I think, so it'll be I think that's clarity great, on the record. A great I, idea. We just have to figure out. I agree. It is It is December 11th. I mean, this hearing started on December 10th and it's now December 11th, so December I agree. December 11th. With now we have to figure out what's 30 days later. I think it'll run on January 10th, but I'm not sure. Yeah, because you have the 31st. If everybody's in agreement with that, then uh, this suspension would run until January 10th. All right, we have a motion from Councilman Dingfelder. Right. We have a second from Councilman Goods. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The okay. motion carried unanimously uh, with Carlson being absent. All right. Mr. Chairman, if we, yes. just for the purposes of making sure all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed, if we can, because this is the final action, just a roll call vote, if you don't mind, please. Sure. We have a roll motion from vote. Councilman Dingfelder, second from Councilman Goods. Roll call vote. Vieira? Yes. Goods? Yes. Dingfelder? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Carlson? Citro? Yes. Miranda? Yes. The motion carried with Carlson being absent. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Mr. Velez? Yes. Again, uh, with these sanctions being imposed now, if we can make sure that we uh, submit a copy to the state yes, in reference to the violations of the, of, the, of the city, and also we can look at uh, in the future, uh, if, uh, again, the, with sanctions, if code. someone is trying to apply and sanctions are imposed or they're, or, or they're under a suspension at the time. Yes, sir, we will. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. It's 12.30 a.m., and we have three more cases. <laughs> Item number 18. <laughs> Ryan Manassi, Development Coordination. Item number 18 is file number REZ 20-85. Um, it's for the property located at 2302 West Virginia Avenue. They're requesting to go from zoning classification RS50 to PD for detached single-family residential. I will defer to the Planning Commission if you'd please return to me afterwards. Good evening, Council Members. David Hay with your Planning Commission staff. I have been sworn. If I could share my screen, please. If I could share my screen. There we go. All right, in recognition of the late hour, I am going to be extremely brief. We're within the Central Tampa uh, Planning District. Here's an aerial of the subject site, Virginia. It's south of Martin Luther, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, uh, east of North Armenia Avenue. The area is predominantly single family detached. There's commercial up on Martin Luther King. Um, and commercial on North Armenia. The subject site and all the properties around it are that residential 10, future land use category. Um, there's more information within the submitted um, report, so if you have any questions, please let me know. But overall, the subject site would be developed with a similar form, height, scale, and lot pattern of the surrounding residential uses. And the Planning Commission staff recommends that the rezoning request be found consistent with the provisions of the imagined 2040 Tampa Comprehensive Plan. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Hay? Mr. Manassi? Thank you, sir. Ryan Manassi, Development Coordination. I'll put the site plan on screen for you. Um, again, item number 18 is REZ 20-85 for the property located at 
2302 West Virginia Avenue. Um, there were no waivers requested for this um, rezoning. They're requesting go from residential single family 50, RS 52 PD to allow for the two single family detached residential lots. The property is located on the southwest corner of the West Virginia Avenue, North Howard Avenue intersections. And the property contains two platted lots, lots one and two of block six of the Rio Vista plat. The platted lots were originally orientated with lot frontage on North Howard Avenue with each, me each lot measuring 51.2 feet in width and 95 feet in depth. The proposed lot dimensions are 47 and a half or 47.5 feet in width and 102.4 feet in depth for each lot. The proposed lot area is 4,866 square feet with a lot frontage on West Virginia Avenue. Uh, the required minimum lot width in the RS50 zoning district is 50 feet with a 5,000 square foot minimum lot area. Therefore, the only way for to allow for these two buildable lots is to request the plan development as the lots have been in single ownership with one will not meet the RS50 minimum lot area requirement. The proposed setbacks for the single family dwellings are front 20 feet for the main structure and 16 feet for the front porch, side six feet and rear 20 feet. The maximum building height is 35 feet. The property is surrounded by zoning districts RS50 to the, to the west, north and east and PD file REZ 1985 to the south, all consisting of single family detached residential uses. Uh, staff did do an analysis of the development pattern of the area. Um, it's outlined in page three of your staff report. Um, going down through it, the original or the, we, we took parts of the subdivision as well as the overall development area and conclude that down to the lots that are abutting or the blocks that are abutting to it as well as the lot face. And I'll read the last paragraph of that staff analysis on page three. Um, pursuant to the review of the, de the existing development pattern, the subject block contains 17 total zoning lots. Um, 15 or 88 percent of those lots have been developed with a width of 50 feet or greater and two or 12 percent have been developed with a, a width of 49.99 feet or less. The 2300 block of West Virginia Avenue, which is both sides of the street, contains 16 total, total zoning lots. Um, 16 of those lots have been developed with a width of 50 feet or greater and zero have been developed with a, a width of 59.99 feet or less. Again, a, a total of 0% of the subject block face have been developed with a width of 49.99 feet or less. Um, with that being said, staff did, uh, uh, we identified that 94% of the lots in the study area, 88% of those, 88% uh, of the subject block and 100% of the block face and 23, uh, in the 2300 block of West Virginia Avenue are 50 feet or greater in width. Um, it's staff's professional opinion that historical Historically, platted lots were uh, generally 50 feet in width with the creation of two proposed 47.5-foot uh, wide lots would create an anomaly in a way that the study area was actually um, developed. Uh, staff finds the proposed reconfiguration of the original platted lots inconsistent with the existing development pattern of the overall study area, block face, um, and block. Um, there were no historic landmark structures within the 1,000-foot radius that we look at. Um, here's an aerial map showing the subject property outlined in red. There are, um, again, development co coordination did find it inconsistent. There are site plan modifications should this be approved for uh, natural resources and urban design as outlined in the revision sheet of the staff report. And. Uh, show you some photos real quick of the area. There's the site. Site again, the east side. This is the east of the site. This is looking down Howard. Northwest corner of Kennedy. Looking at West Virginia. On Virginia. Northwest corner of Howard and Virginia, and the northwest corner of Virginia and Howard. Development review and compliance staff has reviewed the application. We find it inconsistent with the City of Tampa Land Development Code. Please reference the findings by development coordination related to the existing development pattern of the immediate area. Again, if it's the pleasure of City Council to approve this application, there are minor modifications that would be required between first and second reading as stated in the revision sheet, and if you would please include that in the motion if approved. Staff is available for any questions you may have. Mr. Chair, Councilman Dinkfelder has questions. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Um, Ryan, I appreciate the, the, the work you guys put into each one of these, but 
if they had if they had left these lots facing Howard, it'd be 51 by 95 in depth. Okay, well, two questions. One, why didn't they, why are they reorient, reorienting these if it's, if it's 51 width and 95 de deep? It would, I mean, we'd probably have to talk to the applicant and ask them why they were presenting, um, presenting it in this fashion. Okay. But if, if they had, mm -hmm. then you wouldn't have had to do an evaluation of less than 50. But, but since they t turned it 90 degrees because they want to be on West Virginia for whatever reason, it's still the same total square footage. The, the lot... The lot square footage is 4,866. It's 134 square feet short of the 5,000 required, which is only 3% less. So, so the whole evaluation is based upon that two and a half feet difference. They're two and a half feet. Each of those lots is two and a half feet short. Correct, sir. Um, the the reason for the conforming map again, as you stated, is because of the the insufficient uh, lot width. Um, just looking at the plan, it look, I mean, there is a possibility if they were to cut it this way that this this access onto Howard may, be, may not meet corner clearance. I mean, I could talk to Jonathan about that. Um, but again, I, I think the applicant can explain why they proposed this rezoning in this manner. Okay. I just wanted to, I guess, take us down to brass tacks, which is that each of these lots has proposed, has is only 134 square feet short of the total, the total 5,000 required and two and a half feet in width short. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, thank you very much. The applicant. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Vivian Hernandez. 17117 Lakeshore Road. I represent Mad Dog Construction, which is the current owner of the property. And to answer your question, sir, the reason why the property was placed, or actually the, the way that it was divided, is because there is no water or sewer running in on Howard. So we would not be able to build eventually what we want to do um, because of that. Now, um, we're asking for rezoning. There was um, from a RS-50 to a PD. Um, it was done previously in the home or in the property in the rear or actually in the south of this property. So it has been done before, and we will need, like I said, um, to subdivide it into two lots of 47 and a half feet wide by, um, and the setbacks to be six feet in order to fit the home. Now, the one in the corner, um, we were asked to move the driveway to the side, um, which was done, and that was provided. So I can answer any questions you may have. Councilman Good. And you said this, you have, there's no city sewer on Howard? Correct. On Howard Avenue, there's no, no, Storm no water or sewer Storm running water. through there. And you did the notice letter to the yes, sir. Mm -hmm. people within 250 feet. Um, did you get any objection? No. Get any calls at all? I did. I got a call from the lady, um, the neighbor across the street, um, just wanting to know the house has been vacant for a while, and she just wanted to know, you know, if we were going to build two-story homes, and I told her no, it would just be one story, and she was okay with that. Thank you. Anybody else? 
Do we have anybody in the public that wishes to speak on this item? Item number 18, RAZ 20-85. Do we have anybody registered for this item? I don't believe we do. No one has registered to speak on this item. Thank you very much. Move to close. We have a motion close from Councilman Citro, second from Councilman Goose. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Uh, Councilman Dingfelder, would you like to read this item? 18? Sure. Uh, get my act together. Okay. I'll move, uh, I'll move uh, in regard to REZ 20-85, following ordinance for first reading. An ordinance rezoning property in the general vicinity of 2302 West Virginia Avenue in the city of Tampa, Florida, more particularly described in Section 1 from Zoning District Classification RS-50 Residential Single Family to PD Plan Development Residential Single Family Detached provide an effective date. Uh, specifically, I'll move the ordinance. Um, and if there's any revisions, I'd, there, yes, there, there's a revision. I, I would, my motion would include those revisions. Um, as indicated by staff, I believe the applicants met her, her burden of proof by providing competent substantial evidence that the development as conditioned and shown on the site plan is consistent with the comprehensive plan and the city code. Um, specifically, um, uh, the planning commission staff has uh, recommended approval. It's consistent with uh, various housing policies to enc encourage new housing on vacant and underutilized land and specifically consistent with our uh, land development code, uh, section 27-136 uh, for proposed developments um, to promote the efficient and sustainable use of land and infrastructure. And even though the width um, is slightly less than what we require 50 feet, uh, it's two and a half feet less or 5% or less than the required width, uh, I feel the difference is de minimis and will not adversely affect the surrounding area. <coughs> Do we have a second? Second. Second from Councilman Vieira. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Aye. Mr. Uh, and the reason is that, aye, and the reason is that uh, what's acceptable in some parts of the city and not acceptable in another. Until it all the cities alike, I continue to vote no. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Councilman I, 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 didn't, I, I didn't give my vote. I'm going to vote no as well. Okay. Let's do a roll call vote. Yeah, let's do a roll call vote. Vieira? Yes. Goods? No. Dingfelder? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Carlson? Citro? Yes. And Miranda? No. The motion carried with Carlson being absent. And Goods and Miranda voting no. Second reading and adoption will be on January 14th at 9.30 a.m. Thank you very much. Item number 20. Ryan Manassi, Development Coordination. Item number 20 is file number REZ 20-89 for the property located at 3205 West Arch, Arch Street. Um, they're requesting a rezone from RS50 residential single family to PD for residential single family detached. Um, I'll defer to the Planning Commission and then please return to me. Good, e uh, good evening, Council Members. David Hay again with your Planning Commission staff. I have been sworn. Uh, we continue our string of zonings uh, within the Central Tampa Planning District. Here we have an aerial of the subject site. Uh, you can see it's predominantly single family detached around it. It's south of Interstate 275 and McFarland Park. Um, it's north of Cypress, uh, west of North of McDill Avenue. You can see here's the uh, future land use map. The subject site and all the parcels around it in that tan color are the residential 10. You don't get down to a non-residential category until down to Cypress, which is represented by the uh, pink color. Um, overall, the proposed uh, rezoning would be developed with a similar form, height, lot size, and scale of the surrounding residential uses. The proposed rezoning supports the comprehensive plan. It would not alter this portion of West Arch Street's character or development pattern. You do have our submitted report with additional information and policy guidance 
If you have any questions, uh, please let me know. And that concludes my presentation. Any questions? Mr. Manassi. Thank you, sir. Ryan Manassi, Development Coordination. Again, item number 20 is file number REZ 20-89 for the property located at 3205 West Arch Street. Um, this is a request, again, from RS52 PD for plan, uh, plan development residential single family detached. There are no waivers being requested with this petition. Um, the applicant, again, is proposing to rezone this um, to the PD um, shown on screen. The, uh, the property is located three lots to the west of West Arch Street in North Matanzas Avenue intersection. The property contains portions of three platted lots, west half of lot 22, lot 21, and the east 25 feet of lot 20, block 9 McFarland Park. The minimum lot area for RS50 is a uh, zoning district is 5,000 square feet. The application requests for the two lots to be configured with each lot containing a lot width of 50 feet and a lot area of 4,900 square feet. Um, the length is 98 feet as shown on the plan. Uh, given the existing overall lot area of 9,800 square feet, uh, the, way, the only way to request to establish the lots is to request this plan development. Uh, the project proposes vehicular access on West Arch Street for, for parcel A and alley access for parcel B. Uh, the proposed PD setbacks for parcel A are front 20 feet, side 7 feet on the east, 9 foot on the west, and the rear 24 feet. The proposed PD setbacks for parcel B are the front 20 feet. I had a correction to the staff report. It's uh, the side 5 foot on the east and then 13 foot on the west and rear at 32 feet. The maximum building height is proposed at 35 feet. Um, the property is surrounded by RS50 zoning district in the north, south, east, and west with single family detached dwellings on all sides. The, there is a historic structure within 1,000 feet of the subject property. It's George Gita Senior House, um, 1516 North Renfrew Street. And I will show you the aerial map really quickly. Um, I'll save you the pictures unless you'd like me to show you the staff photos that we took of the subject area. Um, but all the houses that are surrounding this area are single family detached dwelling units. And with that being said, the Development Review and Compliance staff has reviewed the application and we find it consistent with the City of Tampa Land Development Code. Um, if you would, please reference findings by development coordination related to the existing development pattern in the median area. And I believe, I'm sorry, let me just make sure there was no revision sheet. I don't have a revision sheet, so the plan as submitted is, is, is good for planning staff for a second reading if approved. Thank you very much, Councilman Citro. Mr. Manassi, uh, you said that this, this lot was only 90 foot deep or 98 foot deep? 98 foot, sir. How many, how many other lots with on, on this block are uh, 98 foot deep? I, is it consistent with the block, that the, the short, two foot short? I do not have the survey in front of me, and that might help me out determining the lots that are adjacent to it. Um, it appears that there is that alley that's um, to the, the north of the properties, the asphalt pavement. So this lot that would be over here would be most likely consistent with the same depth of these two lots. Um, so I, I would make the assumption that the, the adjacent lots are at the same length of 98 feet. Thank you, Mr. Manassi. Thank yes, you, Mr. Sir. Chair. Thank you very much. Mr. Robles. Thank you, Council. My name is Kevin Robles. I reside at 2107 Chestnut Forest. Um, thank you, Ryan. You've done a nice job of explaining. I don't want to add two items in and then I'll um, let the report stand. The uh, one site setback on the property to the west was adjusted to accommodate uh, the preservation of a grand tree, and the, and the entire block is platted at 98 feet deep, just for the record. Thank you. With Any an questions active, for the gentleman? With an active alley. I have nothing else of count. Any questions? No? Anybody in the public wish to speak on this item? Fred? No? All right, do we have anybody registered on the uh, online for item number 20? Move to no one has registered to speak on this item. All right, can I get a motion to close? Yes. Uh, oh. ju just for the record, is this a lot split? Yes, sir. Thank yes. you. All right, we have a motion from Councilman Vieira. Do we have a second? Second. Second, second from Councilman Citro to close. All in favor? Aye. 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 Councilman Citro, would you mind taking item number 20? Thank you very much. Uh, item number uh, REZ 2089. 
We'll move an ordinance being presented first reading an ordinance rezoning the property in the general vicinity of 2305 West Arch Street in the city of Tampa, Florida, and more particularly described in section one from district classification RS50, residential single family, to PD plan development, residential single family detached, providing an effective date as the petitioner has met the burden of proof. I also find that the um, compliance with the applicable goals, of, it is in compliance with the applicable goals, goals and objectives and policy of the comprehensive plan, more particularly consistent with land use policy one, excuse me, 2.1.1 and 2.1.2, which encourages the use limited resources more difficultly, more effectively by encouraging infill development uh, and vacant and underused land and with the compliance with the land development code section 27-136 uh, proposed development as shown on the site plan promotes and encourages development that is appropriate in the location character and compatibility with the surrounding neighborhoods as in all of them having a depth of only 98 feet and, and mr chairman just to confirm uh councilman that was 3205 west arch street is that correct that's correct thank you second we have a second from Council Member Vieira. Roll call vote. Vieira? Yes. Goods? No. Dingfelder? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Carlson? Citro? Yes. And Miranda? Again, I will be voting no since uh, this is a lot split and the whole city is not treated equally. Uh, only in certain areas will they pass. No. The, the motion carried with Carlson being absent <coughs> and Goods and Miranda voting no. Second reading and adoption will be on January 14th at 9.30 a.m. Mr. Manassi. Sir, uh, develop, uh, Ryan Manassi, Development Coordination, item number 21 is <coughs> file number REZ 20-90. It's for the property uh, located at 3718 North 31st Street. Um, they're requesting a rezone from RS50 to PD for residential single family detached. Um, I'll defer to David Hay with the Planning Commission. Please return to me so I can finish. Yes, sir. Good evening, Council Members. David Hay with your Planning Commission staff. I have been sworn. We end the night in the Central uh, Tampa Planning District, uh, where the subject site is located uh, in the center of the aerial. This is North 30th Street. And then you have Lindell Avenue on the north side. Uh, the subject site and all the properties surrounding it are within that residential 20. There is additional density further to the east with the residential 35 and single family detached further south. Uh, overall, um, the PD proposes an overall density of 10.89 units per acre based on uh, that and the policies uh, within the uh, submitted uh, staff report. The Planning Commission staff has determined the PD provides for a comparable and compatible development pattern it would be of a similar form height and lot size and scale to existing development within the surrounding area based on that planning commission staff recommends to you that this rezoning be found consistent with the provisions of the imagine 2040 temper comprehensive plan any questions? that concludes my presentation happy new year any questions for the gentleman no mr manassi Ryan Manassi, Development Coordination. Again, item number 21 is up file number REZ 20-90. And it's for the property located at 3718 North 31st Street. The request again before you is RS50, current zoning, and they're requesting to go to PD plan development for residential single family detached. And uh, make a point to state that there are no waivers being requested with this application uh, for the plan development. Um, the property is located on the west side of North 31st Street, three lots south of Lindell Avenue. The property is currently vacant and contains a portion of one platted lot Lot 4, Block B, Bethel Heights, less 3 feet. The detached single-family residence to the north, um, located at 3720 North 31st Street, encroaches 2 feet into the historically platted Lot 4, Block B of the Bethel Heights. In order to remedy this uh, structural encroachment, the northern 3 feet of Lot 4 will be deeded to the northern lot. Um, this will result in the subject property having a lot width of 43 feet and a lot area of 3,999 square feet. The minimum lot area in RS50 is 5,000 square feet with a minimum lot width of 50 feet. And again, the only way to develop this lot would be to propose the PD request. Um, the proposed PD setbacks are the front 26 feet, side 5 feet, rear 15 feet. Uh, the maximum building height is proposed at 50, uh, I'm sorry, 35 feet. 
Um, the property is surrounded by zoning district RS50 to the north, south, east, and west, west with single family detached dwellings all, dwellings on all sides. The subject site is located in the East Tampa overlay, and, and, uh, overlay District and must comply with district design standards at the time of permitting. Um, the staff analysis uh, included 513 total zoning lots, 428 or 84% of those lots have been developed with a width of 50 feet or greater, and 85 or 16% have been developed with a width of 49.99 feet or less. Um, pursuant to the review of the existing development pattern, the subject block contains 17 total zoning lots, Seven or 41 percent of those lots have been developed with a width of 50 feet or greater, and 10 or 59 percent have been developed with a width of 49.99 feet or less. The 3700 block itself of North 31st Street, which is both sides of the street, contains 15 total zoning lots. Two or 13 percent of those lots have been developed with a width of 50 feet or greater, and 13 or 87 percent of them have been developed with a width of 49.99 feet or less. The block face itself on North 31st Street contains eight total zoning lots, and 100% of those lots, eight of them, have been developed the width of 49.99 feet or less, um, and none have been developed with a width of 50 feet or greater. That was a correction on page three of the staff report. Mr. Nancy, read that last remark. You said none have been built with a width of 50 feet? Sure, I'm sorry. And let me make the correction, too. On that last sentence of that staff analysis on page three, there is a correction. That's I read the corrected part. Um, I'll read it again. The block face, so let me, I'm sorry, let me throw this on screen. I forgot to do that for you. So what we're looking at, obviously, the total zoning lots, and we start pulling it down, and what I'm talking about now would be the, before the last sentence was both sides of the streets, and now we're going to talk about this block face right here. And as you can see, they're all this light bluish color, which indicates the 45 to 49 feet lot width. So my last uh, sentence of my staff analysis, it states the block face well, the corrected version states the block face of North 31st Street contains eight total zoning lots. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, eight or 100 percent of those lots have all been developed with a width of 49.99 feet or less. So all these less than that 50 basically and zero have been developed with 50 feet or greater. So based upon that analysis, staff did find the proposed request for rezoning consistent with the existing development pattern in the immediate area. Um, there were no historic uh, landmark sites within 1,000 feet. Um, there was only site plan modifications requested by development coordination, and those should be shown on the revision sheet on page 8. Um, I'll show you the aerial just to give an idea of the area. So here's Lindell, the subject site outlined in red. And I do have staff photos, but in, in light of time, um, as I stated in the staff report, all the lots that are surrounding this property are single family residential and um, um, either vacant or being used for detached single family dwelling units. Um, with that being said, the development review and compliance staff has reviewed the application. We find it consistent with the City of Tampa Land Development Code. Please reference the findings by development coordination related, related to the existing development pattern in the immediate area. And again, if it is a pleasure of City Council to approve this application, the minor changes as outlined in the staff report would be needed between first and second reading. Staff is available for any more questions. Any questions? Mr. Chair, if I may, Mr. Yes. Manassi, please indulge me. If we were to approve this, would that adjacent building that is encroaching two foot over, does that building become non-compliant? Through the PD rezoning, um, the review process, we wouldn't uh, allow it to get to the point to where we'd create a non-conforming through this PD process. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Councilman Moran. I just want to make sure that all the lots are the same size as this. This is not a lot split then? Um, and I could show you on screen. I could bring up that conforming map again. I don't know. Let me zoom in maybe. That's not working too well. Um, so yes, sir. Um, you, your question was all the lots are the same. The, the two differences in the, the both sides of the street here are these two lots. They're vacant. Um, but the remainder of the lots are all that with 45 feet to 49 feet. So when staff looked at the analysis, we determined through the percentage and the uh, analysis of the, the total area, then breaking it down and coming down to the, the block uh, face itself, um, found it consistent because these lots are all between 45 feet and 49 feet. But the lots in the red area or the blue area be the red area? Uh, blue area, sir, are 45 to 95. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> 45 to 49 feet. And here's the subject site. 
outlined in black. These two red lots are 80 to 80, 80 to 99, and then 100 plus. So these are the two, All right. I'd say, anomaly, anomalies. And All right, thank you. Not as consistent with the rest of the lots in that area. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Um, Kevin Rubbles, I've been sworn in. Um, I only have a couple of clarifications. Um, the adjoining property to the north with the encroaching masonry structure was never in singular ownership. This PD is strictly to straighten out a situation where they were issued a building permit and the house was placed incorrectly on the adjoining property to the north. The, the simplest solution was to deed over two, th two, three feet, two feet over to the adjoining property owner to bring both to bring the lot into compliance and allow the development of this undeveloped lot. All right, any questions? Do we have anybody in the public that wishes to speak on this item? Are you in support? I'm in support. <laughs> Do we have anybody registered? Because I saw that there was one name uh, registered, but maybe incorrect. There's a red and it said it was to the applicant, uh, Will Dowd, but we did not receive any registered speaker okay. on this item besides him. All right, can we get a motion to close? Hey, Michelle. So moved. Second. We have a motion from Councilman Miranda, second from Councilman Vieira. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Councilman Citro, would you mind reading item number 21? <clears throat> Give me one second, please, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. We've been here for seven hours, and you just now getting the computer up. <laughs> Be careful. I haven't made the motion yet. <laughs> he takes his time. It's an art. It's an art. Good Lord. Help me. Oh, going back to where I was. Thank you. In um, file number REZ 20-90, Ordinance being presented for first reading consideration in ordinance of rezoning the property in the general vicinity of 3718 North 31st Street in the city of Tampa, Florida, and more particularly scribe section one from zoning district classification RS50 residential single family to PD planning development residential single family detached providing for an effective date. As the compliance with the applicable goals and objectives and policies in the comprehensive plan consistent with land use policy 2.1.1 and 2.1.2, which is encourages the use of limited resources more effectively by encouraging infill development on vacant and underutilized land and is in compliance with the land use, excuse me, land development code section 27-136. Excuse me, the purpose use promotes an effective and sustainable use of land and infrastructure. Second. We have a motion from Council Member Citro, Citro with a second from Council Member Vieira. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Keep aye. Saying aye. Any opposed? The motion carried with Carlson being absent. Second reading and adoption will be on January 14th at 9.30 a.m. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Council. Chair. It's 1.06 a.m., and that concludes our agenda. We go to new business. Councilman Miranda, do you have anything, sir? Yes, sir. One, I would like to make a motion to present accommodation to Stephen Lytle, who served on the city's budget advisory committee Second. for approximately five years, three of which he was chairman of the committee. Stephen recently received a promotion of his work and will be relocating out of the state in early 2021. This to be given in a, in a date in the future. We have a motion from Councilmember Miranda. And I believe Vieira with the second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Anything else, sir? No, sir. Councilman Seacher, do you have anything, sir? Uh, nothing. I'm just going to go home and eat a bunch of ice cream and go to sleep. Why, why do you take my ideas? That's what I, you know. I, I'm eating high test ice cream. Uh, Mr. Chair, you're eating the low fat. <laughs> Councilman Dinkel. <laughs> I've got three or four here. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Oh, thank I got goodness. It. I got it. Good. Councilman Goods. Mr. Chairman, we need to thank uh, Mr. Krug. Uh, he celebrated his 25th year with the city. Uh, hey, congratulations. Very good. Nothing else, sir. 
Councilman Vieira. I, I unfortunately got a couple. I apologize. I move for a commendation, if I may, for the family of the late Mr. Bruce Burnham, who is known as the voice of Armwood and a member of Vietnam Veterans of America 787. He recently passed on due to Agent Orange. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Councilman Citro. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Go ahead. I've, I've got a couple more, but I'll, I'll go through these just um, uh, really fast. I, I saw that um, we may have legislation in Tallahassee on preemption of the apprenticeship ordinance. We're going to look at it. I just saw it today, but I'll probably be motioning on that in a week or two, so just FYI in that regard. Um, then, you know, the, um, let's see here. And you know what, the rest all, well, no, strike that. Actually, no, there is something just very, very briefly I want to talk about. It's um, on that rule, I think it is 5.4, I believe it is, the rule that precludes um, people in the public from specifically mentioning city council members. I, I, I think we ought to reduce or get rid of that rule. It's never enforced, and it, 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 it leaves the prospect of whenever it is enforced that it's enforced uh, let's say in reaction, I guess, if you will. Um, so I, I know, Mr. Chair, that you were looking at making some uh, rule changes, I think, with an old memo that I did um, w when I was chair just before COVID. So I'd ask that that at least be looked at by our uh, city attorney and just brought back to us. Because again, it's not enforced. It, it, it's, it's, I, I just think it's a silly rule, my opinion. Second. All right. We have a second from Council Member Dingfelder. All if in I favor? Can, if I can, Mr. Chairman. Just for the purposes of the record, Councilman uh, Vieira, you're asking that, um, uh, is it your request that the uh, chair look at uh, changes to Rule 5F relative to the comments shall be directed to the council of bo uh, as a body and not to individual council members? Is that what you're yeah, Yes, sir. Not the one, yeah, yeah, if I may. And, uh, but that that be brought concurrently with the other changes as well. Okay, so that'll mm -hmm. be, so there's no date certain, but when it's going no, to be, just, it's going to be discussed, frankly, I believe, it could be discussed, frankly, next week when we come back with that resolution about the, right. uh, it's going to be coming back. Uh, we have a second from Councilman Dingfelder. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Anything else, sir? I literally have four more, but I'm going to leave them for next week, so thank you. Thank you very much. I just have one thing. Uh, I have a memo from Roger Roscoe at FDOT. They were going to present uh, next Thursday, but they would like to postpone it to a date in January. But we have only one regular meeting in January, correct, Mr. Shelby? I believe that is January 16th or 18th. January, I'm so sorry. January 14th, Mr. All right. Chairman. And uh, is that, <laughs> did you want that uh, presentation in, um, at, at a 9 a.m.? Yeah, um, right. Right after public comment. Right after. Right after public comment. Yes, sir. Okay. And um, is there a length to that presentation? No more than ten minutes, but I don't know, they may not even take that long. Okay. Thank you, sir. <coughs> we have a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco. Do we have a second? Second. Second, second by Councilman uh, Miranda. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. No. Oh, and a happy Hanukkah to those celebrating. And thank you. We'll receive you know. the file. Second. All right. Is there, Thank you. Is that a motion to receive and file? I'm sorry. Okay. We have motion a motion from Councilman Mor uh, Miranda, second from Councilman uh, Dingfelder. All in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned. Good morning.